Aproveite esta oportunidade única para aprimorar seus conhecimentos sobre o uso de transcatéter em doenças cardiovasculares. Vem aí! O International Web Symposium Transcatheter Approach for Valvular Heart Diseases in Review. Um evento gratuito e 100% online com os maiores nomes nacionais e internacionais da área. 10 e 11 de novembro de 2020. Realização, Faculdade de Ciências da Saúde Moinhos de Vento, Núcleo de Valvulopatia e Cardiopatia Estrutural, Serviço de Cardiologia, Cirurgia Cardíaca e Vascular do Hospital Moinhos de Vento. Good night, uh, everybody. Uh, we are going to start now uh, session three of our symposium. And uh, tonight we are going uh, to discuss in this uh, first session uh, the future uh, perspective in uh, the treatment of structural heart disease. Uh, I will chair this uh, session with my colleague and good friend uh, Orlando Wender. And tonight we are going to have in this first session a German session. So I will ask uh, Orlando Wender to present the first speaker. Thank you, Eduardo. It's a great pleasure for me to, to introduce Professor Rudiger Langer, director of the German Heart Center in Munich. It's, uh, I would like to thank very much to Rudiger. Uh, we know that in Munich uh, we ha have a winter time, I think it's 11 o'clock in Munich in this moment, and then I would like to thank uh, Rudiger. I know Rudiger since 1988, 89, when we worked together in Munich. I was fellow, and the Rudiger are assistant in the department. And then Rudiger went to Heidelberg in about uh, 2002, 2003, back to Munich as a director from the German Heart Center. Uh, Rudiger built a very important and big service, big department, surgical department in Europe. Uh, he performed more than 2,000 cardiac surgery yearly and was on the first surgery to work in the structural heart disease. I think Rudiger has nowadays about 2,000 TAVs in the department. He's a very experienced surgeon in the Speciality, and I think uh, Rudiger is the right person, the right surgeon to talk to us about the next part, steps in the structural heart disease today. Thank you, Rudiger. Uma consultoria Moinhos, um novo jeito de Okay. Can you see my screen? Rudiger? Yes. We, we can see you, but not your screen yet. People are working here too. Yes, you have not seen it and I... Uh...
Can you see it now? Yes, okay. we listen, but you okay. can, can yeah. yes, okay. You see, you see everything now? Yes, now it's okay. We can see you and you can see your slides. Okay. So, uh, first I want to thank you for the invitation to uh, give some insights in the next step in structural heart disease, which is uh, quite a difficult topic. And since I'm one of the very few surgeons invited to the structural heart disease uh, convent uh, in, in your wonderful city, I want to give you some insights in some procedures, and I will also take the privilege to talk a little bit about surgery if I'm allowed to. Now let's talk about the aortic valve first. Um, nowadays there are interventional therapies and surgical therapies for the aortic valve. And in terms of interventional therapies, I want to point out just uh, one accessory device. I think the, the the implantation devices, the valves, are already very optimized and have very good results. However, there are some, still some problems with interventional therapies, such as stroke or pacemaker implantation and others. And I would just want to point out one of the accessory devices. And this is the device uh, about stroke. Now, we all know that transcatheter aortic valve implantation carries a lower risk of stroke than surgery. However, there still is a risk between 1.5 to 5% of stroke with transcatheter aortic valve in low risk and in high risk studies, as you see here in this meta analysis. And I think for the future, it will be very important to omit this risk of stroke in the transcatheter, in the patients receiving a transcatheter device. And the studies out there about the effectiveness of uh, embolic protection devices are very diverse. Now, the first study which came out was uh, the Sentinel trial. And in the Sentinel trial, you, you see here that there was no significant difference in 30-day MACE rates, and also no significant difference in new lesion volume uh, on MRI. Now, after this study, which was published in 2017, there have been some studies out which showed less lesion volume with embolic protection devices, but very few studies could really uh, address the issue of stroke. And now on TCT this year, there was an interesting study in 130,000 patients from the US. And first it showed on the left that the proportion of hospitals using embolic protection devices is increasing steadily over the years. And now it's about 28%. However, the amount of patients who receive an embolic protection devices is still very low it is about 30% right now, and the increase is not as steadily as the proportion of HES hospitals using embolic protection devices. Now, the question is, what is the effectiveness? And in this study, in the study of 12,000 patients with an embolic protection device and 110,000 patients without, the authors could show that there was a significant reduction in death or stroke for in-hospital outcomes and also for death and stroke for 30-day outcomes. So if you ask me what are the next steps for embolic protection devices, I think we need more large randomized trials. There are two randomized trials out there right now. There's a single center trial, which is called PROTECT-AVI, which uh, is uh, been carried out in the German Heart Center Munich. And they just started uh, a big multi-center and international uh, uh, randomized trial, which is called Protected Tower, uh, and which is about to enroll uh, more than 2,000 patients. So I think the next step for this uh, accessory device for aortic uh, implantation 
uh, are the evaluation of embolic protection devices for the future. Now, of course, there are not only new things in interventional therapies on the aortic valve, but also in surgical therapies. So let me share with you one new uh, method, which is not quite new, but which, which has, has been renewed in recent years. And this is the total neovascular, uh, neocuspidalization of the aortic valve. As you see here, the pericardium is excised on a template. You, you measure first the, the cusp size, and then you cut the cusp out of autologous pericardium. And the, uh, the cusp are soon in into the aortic annulus taking care that the cusp are more or less equal in size. And you see this here. And here you see the final valve. And in echocardiography, you see uh, wonderful results. It looks almost like uh, the, the native aortic valve. And we had good experience in 152 uh, patients now. And at three years, we had a freedom from a reoperation of 89.7%. And what is very striking are the hemodynamic results. We did a randomized study against the uh, uh, trifecta valve. And it was shown that the uh, mean effective orifice area is significantly uh, greater with the neocuspidalization than with uh, one of the uh, newer generation bioprothesis. And you see this here too. Here you see the flow with the trifecta valve, which, which shows a high speed in the uh, sinotubular junction. And with the neocuspidalization, you see almost the same flow pattern as you have with the native valve. And uh, this, this means that you have a significantly lower flow ve velocity uh, with the neocuspidalization. So what are the next steps for surgery on the aortic valve? I think this new method or this renewed method needs further evaluation of uh, the total aortic cusp reconstruction. And it needs to be evaluated uh, as to the question that it could be an alternative to surgical bioprothetic replacement. Now, after the aortic valve, let's have a look at the mitral valve. Now, at the mitral valve, we have interventional therapies in terms of valve replacement and valve reconstruction, and we have surgical therapies in terms of minimal invasive uh, surgery. Let's have a look at the mitral replacement device for interventional. Uh, use. Uh, during the last almost uh, 10 years, we have seen uh, a lot of devices coming up. However, right now, there are only a few devices left. The M3 Edwards Sapien, the High Life Valve, the Tendine Valve, the Intrepid Valve, which was uh, former a 12th Valve, and the Neovasc Tiara Valve. This is the Abbott tendine mitral valve, which is a valve that can only be implanted through the apex of the heart. It is the only uh, transcatheter mitral valve right, right now, which has CE mark, received CE mark, CE mark early of this year. Um, it is fairly easy to implant, and it's a fairly quick procedure. You see here patient with uh, a, a mitral insufficiency. Um, this is a case from our hospital. Um, the, the wires in the atrium, you check first that you are not entangled in the subvalvular apparatus of the mitral valve. Most of the implantation is echo-guided. Um, the valve has a D shape on the top. So in echo, you can adjust it with the D shape and uh, once the valve is in place and it is anchored to the apex, um, you have uh, 
very good uh, performance with this valve. Now, Everb has changed their summit after the uh, co apt uh, results came out with the Mitra clip. The summit uh, trial was uh, intended originally to randomize tendine implantation to surgical mitral valve implantation, and it was changed now to tendine versus mitral clip. Now, this is another. Uh, very ingenious valve, the Medtronic Intrepid valve. You see here in the center, you have a cylinder with the valve and you have kind of a bumper sheath around this valve so that the movements of the annulus are not transmitted to the cylinder and could not cause any insufficiency of the valve by deformation of the cylinder. Originally, this valve was also implanted through the apex. It was uh, first the cradle was inf inflated, the, uh, inflated in, the, um, in the atrium and then it was retracted and the valve was uh, anchored. It is also a fairly easy implantation. Um, there have been quite some studies out. First, the pilot study right now, the Apollo pivotal trial is running. And since we want to talk about the future and since I think that in the very end, only transfemoral or let's say transeptal approach is uh, successful for this kind of devices. Metronic also started a transfemoral mitral and a transfemoral tricuspid study. All together, 275 patients have been implanted with the intrepid altogether. And let's just have a quick look at the transfemoral program. See here an implantation, a, a transseptal implantation in a patient with severe functional mitral regurgitation. Here, the septum is dilated with an uh, 18 French balloon. Then the delivery system is transversed through the septum. The valve is placed. The atrial part is uh, released first. And then during a period of rapid pacing, as you see here, the valve is then released. And see here, it takes some time. There have only been few implantations, but here you see the end result, uh, which looks fairly good. And the hemodynamic results are also excellent. And right now, uh, uh, Medtronic has two programs. It has uh, a mitral uh, transfermal program, which is now enrolling in 10 sites. 15 patients are planned, and a tricuspid program in 11 sites, and also 15 patients are planned. Now, a totally different concept is the high life valve, which is a two step procedure. But and it, it's also a valve that is exclusively implanted transeptally. So there is a ring around the subvalvular apparatus of the mitral valve, and the the valve frame, the stent frame, is then implanted through the septum. And you see this here in this animation. See how uh, the uh, 18 French catheter comes through the aortic valve, and the, with specially designed tubes, the subvalvular apparatus of the mitral valve is encircled. Both wire ends are externalized. And then over those ends, a prosthetic ring is uh, placed around the subvalvular apparatus and it's closed. And then through the septum, the valve is implanted. A two-component valve has, in general, the advantage that it is, uh, it is uh, uh, a smaller valve, and that's why it's easier to implant it through the septum into the mitral annulus. And here you see an implantation, a patient with severe mitral insufficiency through the aortic valve, 
the subverbal apparatus of the mitral valve is encircled. You see here the ring is placed. Then the septum is punctured, dilated, and the valve frame is then over, over the wire inserted in, in uh, the ring. And as opposed to the intrepid valve, the ventricular part is released first and then the atrial part. And once the valve is placed, the wire is uh, removed. And again, as with the other valves, you have a very nice performance. So what are the next steps for interventional mitral replacement? I think we need further development of transfemoral devices for transeptal implantation, because uh, I personally think that the transfemoral devices uh, will be the ones who will be successful in the end. And of course, we need randomized trials, randomized to uh, other interventional procedures, to reconstruction and randomized to uh, surgery. Now, we also have valve, interventional valve reconstruction on the mitral valve. Here, you all know the uh, success of the mitral clip with uh, more than 100,000 implanted right now. And the COAP study, which showed that uh, uh, optimized directed medical treatment as opposed to mitral clip uh, had a severe uh, impact on all hospitalizations, which were much lower in uh, the patients with the mitral clip, and also all cause mortality was much lower in this uh, study uh, with the mitral clip than with directed medical treatment. However, what most people maybe, maybe not know is that there are very few functional data, long term functional data on the mitral clip. The only study that shows some five year functional results on, of the mitral clip is the old. Everest 2 study. And you see here, after five years, there are still excellent results in surgery. Most patients, uh, one and zero insufficiency, and half of the patients of the mitral clip uh, ex exhibit more than two plus insufficiency. So the, the long term functional results of the mitral clip are missing. And if you look at the TRAMI study, here in uh, <clears throat> almost 2,000 patients, um, it is a bit disappointing to see uh, that after four years, uh, more than half of the patient are, uh, are uh, uh, dead and did not survive or have had cardiac uh, rehospitalization. So there are other uh, devices for the mitral valve, the Carillon and the Edwards mitral cardio band, both devices for analoplasty. And if you look at the left side first for the Carillon, um, it shows the improvement of uh, one, at least one grade in mitral regurgitation. Only 50% of the patients improved, 26% were unchanged, and 23% worsened. And the early results with the cardio band in 60 patients showed that freedom from death or congestive heart failure after one year was only 66%. So I think there is still room for a lot of improvement in those devices. And if you look at the transepical uh, placement of artificial cords with neocord, Edward Sapoon, or the new one, the cord art, you also see in the results that, for example, for the neocord after three years, there is an increasing number of patients with uh, MR severity of uh, more than two. And in, with a harpoon device, there is a 10% reoperation rate. So also for those devices, uh, there is still uh, improvement. So uh, if you ask me what are the next steps for interventional mitral re reconstruction, I would say we need improvement of re reliable reduction of mitral insufficiency. We need improvement of handling because some of these devices are really cumbersome to implant. And we need 
development of further devices, uh, especially for transeptal implantation. Now let's look at surgical therapies. I still think that minimal invasive mitral reconstruction by surgery right now is the gold standard. But if you see here, this is the German statistics over the last 10 years. And it's very obvious that since 2016, there's almost no increase in minimal invasive, in the orange bars, in minimal invasive surgery. 50%, 54, 53. So the, the centers who started with this minimal invasive surgery early are still doing it, but there are almost no centers uh, joining them. And this is uh, something to be concerned about, I think, because I think it should be the gold standard with very good results, with the extremely low mortality. You see a lot of studies from different centers and uh, the, in most centers, the mortality is between zero and 1% for minimal invasive surgery. And we performed a propensity match study in more than 1,000 patients with the stenotomy versus minimal invasive right thoracotomy. And the only difference between those two cohorts was a little bit longer time on the uh, extracorporeal circulation and a little bit longer cross clamp time. But no difference in functional results, as you see here, freedom from mitral valve related reoperation about 90% uh, in both cohorts with stenotomy and right thoracotomy after 10 years, which uh, shows you that the argument of some surgeons who say minimal invasive can never be as good as uh, median stenotomy, you don't have a good access to the valve is just not right, at least not in experienced centers. And of course, the minimal invasive access has all also developed. Here is a posterior prolapse. And we have been using the, uh, for example, the closure devices for the femoral cannulation. We use the uh, 3D camera for the uh, for the reconstruction of the valve, here you see the pericardium being opened and then the atrial lifter being positioned. The patient has a severe posterior prolapse, as you see. Then uh, the, <clears throat> the ring sutures are placed. The, the ring is put in place and uh, the neocords are put on the papillary muscles. And you see here, this is the first test, and you can still adjust the neocord at this uh, stage, and then you get a, a perfect result with this uh, minimal invasive uh, approach. However, this is more cumbersome than median stenotomy, and apparently uh, there are only not all centers in the world started to do this. And last but not least, let me just talk about the tricuspid valve. There are also interventional therapies for valve reconstruction. I do not want to show you any surgical therapies. The surgical therapies are standard nowadays and have excellent results. Now, but what we need and what we all want, of course, are interventional therapies. And here you see the Abbott triclip, the pendant of the uh, mitral clip for the tricuspid valve and the Edwards tricuspid cardio band, which has also been used on the tricuspid valve in some prelim preliminary studies. However, also these results are not, not very uh, successful yet. As you see here, baseline, 94% of the patient had severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation. At 30 days after the Abbott triclip, Still, 44% have severe tricuspid regurgitation and no improvement. Only the more than 55% 50, about have uh, an improvement to mild or moderate. And this is sustained up to six months. Also, 42% have still severe uh, regurgitation. So again, uh, as with the reconstructed devices for the mitral valve, there uh, is some need for improvement here. 
And if you look at the preliminary study in 25 patients with the tricuspid cardiovent, you also see that uh, at two years, 30% 30, 30 of the patients have still torrential, massive, and severe regurgitation. And since we know that the mortality with severe and moderate tricuspid regurgitation is, uh, is very high, I think it's important to find some devices to really reconstruct the tricuspid valve as well as it can be reconstructed in surgery. So last not least, what are the next steps for interventional treatment of tricuspid disease? I think what is very important is earlier referral of patients for tricuspid treatment. If you have a dilated tricuspid annulus of more than 50 millimeters uh, and then functional regurgitation, it's almost impossible to, uh, to uh, treat this valve just with clips because um, the, the tension will be so high that the, that the clips cannot seal this valve. So we need development of more efficient devices for reconstruction, and uh, we need to develop uh, transcatheter tricuspid replacement devices. There have been some uh, preliminary uh, devices out, but in the last two years, um, it was not too much published about transcatheter uh, tricuspid replacement devices. So I hope I could give you some insights about what I think should be improved in the future. And I'm happy to answer questions and to discuss uh, this talk with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rudiger. Thank you very much. A nice, beautiful presentation. We will have next uh, second discussion, and if you have a time, uh, we know you are in the winter time, then you can come back in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, very nice presentation. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Eberhard Grub. Uh, I think uh, most of you know him. He is a pioneer, he is a visionary. Uh, he helped uh, almost all of us here uh, to implement and to develop uh, TAVR uh, programs all over the world, including many places in Europe, in Brazil, in North America. So it's a great pleasure to have you here with us again, Dr. Grub, and we hope next year personally. Uh, Dr. Grub will uh, talk about durability of uh, TAVI valves, uh, an update. Okay. Boa noite a todos. Eu tenho que falar uh, inglês, eu vou falar inglês, <coughs> mas primeiro eu tenho que compartilhar meu, uh, a minha tela. I did. I did. You see it? Uh, not yet. Agora? I can see you, but not the screen yet. Well, I shared the screen. Uh, you see me now, right? Can you see now? Not yet. Yes, now we can see you and we can see your slides. Perfect. Bom, uh, boa noite a todos aí. Eu sei que deveria falar inglês, mas gostaria de poder cumprimentar, pelo menos agora, meus amigos e colegas brasileiros em português. Em primeiro lugar, gostaria de agradecer ao meu amigo Marco Weinstein, aos colegas e organizadores pelo amigável convite para esse simpósio em Porto Alegre. Estou muito feliz por poder estar com vocês hoje, mesmo que seja somente à distância. Tenho ótimas lembranças de Porto Alegre, você sabe tudo, e dos meus amigos de lá 
a gente fez os primeiros tags lá juntos e depois a gente comemorou. Espero que todos estejam bem durante essa pandemia. Fiquem seguros, espero revê-los em breve. E agora eu vou falar inglês porque eu sei que é uma tradução. E o meu grande amigo Rüdiger tem que entender o que eu estou falando. Então, Valve Durability, after Tower, and I would like to give you an update. These are my financial disclosures. Speaker Bureau, Equity Interest and Co-Founder. The first funds catheter valves received CE Market 2007 and have typically been implanted in octogenarians with a somewhat limited life expectancy. With this short history, we are still learning how the valves perform over time. The durability of bioprosthetic valves has been reported by variation in definitions of valve deterioration, surveillance, and follow-up are major limitations in the literature. The field is anxious to expand into younger, potentially more active patients, and to those with comorbidities and with varying anatomies such as bicuspid valves. Before this happens, we should understand if, when, and how transcatheter valves fail in our foundational patient populations so that we can mitigate future complications. Durability with TAVR may be as good or maybe better than surgery in patients at lower surgical risk. However, surgical ABR studies show that valve deterioration tends to occur sooner in younger patients. So what exactly do we mean and what do we know about THV durability? Non-randomized data with the longest follow-up for balloon expandable valves comes from prospective Vancouver study with 19 surviving cover patients at 10 years. Using the 2017 European definition, we can see structural valve deterioration and bioprosthetic valve failure at 10 years was 6.3%. This is almost the same in the core valve data at eight years, also using the 17 European definition, moderate SVD around 3%, severe hemodynamic SVZ in 1.6% and bioprosthetic valve failure, BVF, 7.3%. Valve performance is typically assessed by mean gradients and effective orifice areas. A durable valve displays stable values over time. However, There is and has been used a broad range of current definitions, surgical guidelines, VARC 2, Del Trigo, Bourguignon, traditional methods, and the Mayo Clinic. On top, possible categories, hemodynamic deterioration, structural deterioration, structural failure, with the establishment of proof imaging and reintervention. Possible metrics, performance thresholds, gradients, relative performance, gradients, and then failed valves with reintervention or explants. This is the statement of 2017 European consensus um, highlights the need for standardized definitions and surveillance in both TAVR and SAVR with hopes that this will improve quantification and treatment of valve failure. Now, there's an update. VARC3 definitions are in press. And as you can see here, they're much more detailed. Uh, as you can see here, permanent, intrinsic changes of the valve, which is called structural valve deterioration in three stages, without and with hemodynamic um, failures. And abnormally, 
uh, abnormality non-intrinsic to the valve, non-structural valve deterioration, thrombosis, and endocarditis. And even further, you can see, if we look at SVD, that in stage three, that qualifies as BVF or bioprosthetic valve failure in three stages. Abnormality is here, non-structural valve thrombosis, endocarditis, may actually also lead to bioprosthetic valve failure. What does this mean? First of all, surgeons and interventional cardiologists agreed on common guidelines and common definitions of what has been previously been very difficult in defining which is what and which society is referring to what society, to what uh, um, degeneration. So what is important? Definitions of SVD based on valve-related reinterventions or death certainly underestimate the two incidents of structural valve deterioration. Definitions only based on the presence of high transprosthetic gradients, more than 20 millimeter mercury, overestimate the incidence of SVD. So therefore, definitions of structural valve deterioration must include leaflet or frame structural changes, which is stage one, as I referred to earlier, and irreversible hemodynamic valve failure stage two or three. TAVR has become a safe procedure with great clinical outcomes as shown here. The partner trial cohort A, five-year data, as you can see here, no structural valve deterioration that required re-intervention. Some THVs even show better hemodynamics than surgical valves, as shown here in the Sondergaard study published in 2019 in the low-risk patient population here with core valve versus surgery. However, there are some challenges. The number of valves available for analysis is very limited. And we can know if the data from surviving patients is biased towards the most hemodynamically stable patients. As you can see here, we started out with 3,600 patients at five years, only 216 are available for echo follow-up. Also, PPM, patient prosthesis mismatch. Pibaro defined this as when the effective orifice area of the inserted prosthetic valve, be it TAVR or surgery, is too small in relation to body size. After Pibaro brought PPM to light, it has been associated with worse clinical outcomes, especially in TAV and SAF patients. The vivid registry had a pre-procedural rate of any PPM over 50%, 57.6% in 673 patients, and a rate of severe PPM of 7.6%. TAVR in this study <clears throat> is associated with less PPM than surgery, severe patient procedures mismatch in TAVR 6.2%, in surgery, 27.7, uh, 27, 25.7%. Additional analysis of the core valve expanded use trial found at elevated gradients when PPM was combined with small and medium valves. So the worst is having PPM and implant a small or medium valve. If we look at the vivid registry, durability, five years, 1,000 patients, TAF and SAF. Pre-existing PPM, valve malposition, and the use of balloon expandable valves were independent correlates of all-cause re-intervention as shown here. If you look at re-intervention of eight years, here, patients with severe prosthesis uh, PPM at baseline had significantly higher all-cause re-intervention at eight years compared to those with moderate PPM. Pre-existing PPM in red, moderate PPM in blue. Also, patients undergoing TAF and SAF with adverse balloon expandable valve, EBF, here, 
had significantly higher reintervention rates at eight years than the Medtronic self-expanding valves, only 2%. Data have shown that the majority of core valve and safe head implants, however, are stable over time, five years for core valve and about nine years for some adverse valves. Does this mean now they are durable? We should ask ourselves, should we be concerned about THV durability? The Medtronic and the AdWords approach are different. As you can see here, AdWords is using the Carpentier uh, AdWords surgical bioprosthesis at their gold standard, and they tried to imitate their TAVA valve according to the success of the Carpentier AdWords valve. Medtronic approached differently, different valve type, different leaflets, different material. Thinner porcine leaflets, which means lower profile, anti-mineralization treatment. The leaflet geometry of core valve is different from Edwards, and as we all know, it is a superannular valve. There are hypothetical reasons for reduced durability in TAVA valves. Device characteristics such as anti-lack of anti-calcification, leaflet morphology and design, valve crimping, and of course, device under expansion, paravalvular regurg, and asymmetric expansions. All those are reasons for reduced THV durability. So let us go then to the structural valve deterioration. Similarly to bioprosthetic surgical valves, TAVA valves are subject to fail. New strategies will be needed to manage inevitable clinical realities later in their lives. Possible reasons for structural deterioration, incomplete stent frame expansion or myopositioning, as I mentioned before, native bicuspids, procalcific conditions such as renal insufficiency, and leaflet damage through crimping or post dilatation. So then how does TAVA durability compare to surgery? First and foremost, most of our understanding of bioprosthetic structural valve deterioration comes from surgery studies. Current data on rates of, of SVD among surgical valves are however limited by small patient numbers as shown down here in red. There are, there are questions about TAVA durability and their potential reasons why TAVA valves have less durability than surgery. The TAVA leaflets are thinner. TAVA leaflets experience higher stresses and strains. TAVA requires crimping. TAVA has more parabolic leak. And the first generation had, did not have anti-calcification treatment. However, if we then compare Sapien XT S3 versus surgery, we can see here is surgery in the middle, SVD and BVF. Certainly XT has done worse as compared to surgery, but S3 is approaching it and as good as surgery. The five-year durability data from the partner 2A trial in intermediate risk patients show no hemodynamic difference between TAVA and surgery long-term. However, rates of aortic valve reinterventions were significantly higher with TAVI compared to surgery at five years. If we look at core valve and using the European definition, we can see SVD occurred in 4.8% in the notion trial using core valve versus 24% in surgery at 72 months. If we look at the re-intervention like we did before with Edwards, again, using European definition, we can say patients in the TAVI arm demonstrated significantly lower mean gradients and higher opening areas at five years comparing to surgery. However, valve re-intervention was numerically higher with TAVI compared to surgery at the same time interval. If we look at the balloon expandable and such expandable valves based on ESC definitions, we can say here the studies at a follow-up of five to eight years using that definition, severe SVD 
is reported at zero to 6% and BBF, bioprosthetic valve failure, one to 8% as mentioned before. But looking at the choice trial five year, there's a difference between balloon expandable valves and self-expanded valves. SVD, structural valve deteriorations occurred more often, 6.6% in balloon expandable than zero in self-expandable valves. So we have to follow those very carefully. But if we say in general, TAVA durability, so far, so good. Long-term data on TAVA patients is limited, of course, since valves were implanted in older, higher risk patients. But current data suggests that we have less structural deterioration than surgery as shown here, 26 versus 9.2. The remaining severe thrombosis and endocarditis are the same. Moving on then to thrombosis. Symptomatic thrombosis, reasons for late thrombosis of TAVR, incomplete stem frame expansion malpositioning, incomplete apposition with the native valve, and delayed or incomplete endothelialization. Subclinical asymptomatic leaflet thrombosis occurred in 40% in the Portico IDE study, 13% in the resolved and savory registries. Association with neurologic event, three strokes and three TIAs. As we all know, these phenomenon, subclinical leaflet thrombosis, affecting leaflet motions are called HALT, hypoattenuation leaflet thickening, found in 38% of valves, and HAM, if it affects motion, in 20%. So what does that mean? HALT affecting more than 50% of valve leaflets, shown here on the right side, or reduced leaflet motion more than 50%, may be more clinically meaningful than lower gradients on this side. However, what exactly does it mean affecting stroke TIAs and durability? The low risk study did not show an association of hard and increased stroke or TIA events. Also, it's unknown whether hard affects leaflet integrity and durability for now, and therefore, Routine 4D CTA studies, as been suggested earlier, remains unclear as of now. However, there's still unanswered question regarding thrombosis. Depth, probably not needed. Anticoagulation may not help at all. Anticoagulation for valve and valve, question mark. And treatment for halt, and how long? These questions have to be answered. The optimal antithrombotic regimen for TAVA patients is yet undefined. Current guideline recommendations are informed by small, non-randomized studies and expert consensus. In real-world practice, post-TAVA antithrombotic regimens vary greatly. Let me finish with the key takeaways of my talk. Earlier definitions of valve durability focused on soft clinical endpoints, such as reoperation or presumed valve-related death, which clearly underestimated the true frequency of structural valve deterioration. Recently, standardized definitions have been developed focusing on prosthesis-centered and patient-centered outcomes using serial echocardiography and longitudinal follow-up to report valve durability and accounting for competing risk. Data on surgical valve SVD is limited. Recent data from the Vivid Registry estimate a median time to re-intervention of nine years. In all common population, self-expanding valves yielded lower rates of cumulative hemodynamic SVD compared to surgery out to six years. And finally, clinical trials in intermediate and low risk patients will follow patients out to 10 years and provide much needed information on TAVR valve durability. The final thought, very important. We must make sure 
that we leave a patient with a bioprosthetic valve, both surgical or transcatheter, that is a good platform for future TAVR if the previously implanted valve fails. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Muito obrigado pela atenção. Uh, thank you very much. It was a nice overview of uh, TAVR durability. Uh, now we have about uh, 15 uh, minutes of uh, panel discussion with different uh, uh, colleagues from uh, different specialities here on the table. I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Miguel Gus, uh, who is a, an experienced uh, clinical cardiologist, to, to make some uh, comments or, or questions. Thank you, Saji. Um, thank you, professor. Professors from Germany. It was uh, outstanding presentations, when, and I learned very, uh, very much today. Uh, I want to remember first that in, in 2009, it was the first two cases here in the Hospital Munoz de Vento of TAV implantation. And Dr. Grubi came here, and one of these patients was uh, an old fat lady that was my patient and I want to say to Dr. Gruby that she lived very well for almost 10 years. Well, uh, as a clinician, I want to, to ask uh, one question to Dr. Gruby. What a clinician can do nowadays to uh, make sure that the durability of the valve can be uh, well done? A strict uh, blood, blood pressure control, use a statin, antiplatelet uh, scheme. What can we do nowadays? We don't, uh, he showed that we don't have uh, clinical trials, but what can we do to improve the durability of a valve? Well, first of all, Miguel, very good uh, to hear you. I cannot see you, but to hear you, and I'm glad the patient that we treated, uh, your patient that we treated was uh, still having a good life. As far as what can we do uh, in, in the general population for TAVA post implant, it really is not much to say at this point because studies are ongoing. And usually what we do is um, we use um, aspirin and uh, clopidogrel, but this is not based on any foundation, to be honest. It is something that we started many years ago, as you know, and we continued without a foundation uh, for this treatment. Therefore, anticoagulation to prevent possibly Early degenerations um, have been in question because thrombosis is occurring both in surgery and in TAVR. And therefore, anticoagulation is a question. But the question is not answered yet, as I tried to point out, both with NOAX and with Coumadins or Warfarin. And so, for the time being, regular consults at a cardiologist who has experience with a post tavra implantation, uh, echocardiograms, electrocardiograms, all the, the risk factors for problems um, like atrial fibrillation uh, and um, echocardiograms, valve leaflets, um, left ventricular dimensions are, uh, I would recommend that. Usually what we do if the patient is followed up at a family practitioner or at an intervention cardiologist with regular EKG, blood work, and uh, echocardiograms. Of course, if you want to do a thorax uh, x-ray, uh, you can do that too. But most importantly, those are the ones. If there is a suspicion, then you have to consult the implanting center, whether you need any further studies such as uh, CT or M uh, NMR or something like that. Okay, Dr. Philippe Fuchs is an uh, intervention of cardiologists here in the Hospital Moïse de Vento. Could you ask some question?
Hello? Dr. Gruby, it's very nice to see you, my friend. I don't Felipe, think... muito bom, muito you, bom. Are you see, you're not seeing us here, right? right? No. Okay. No. I can see myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It was, uh, it was a brilliant talk. Uh, congratulations, as usual, your talks are very uh, uh, brilliant. Uh, I have a question uh, you kind of answered in the last slide, but uh, I, you weren't very clear and didn't elaborate on that. Uh, and we have a lot of surgeons here, so I think it's good for discussion. Uh, do you think nowadays STAVI is, can be considered the standard uh, treatment for uh, severe aortic stenosis? Do you think uh, the surgical uh, treatment is the exception for uh, some patients with anatomical contraindications to TAVI? Or uh, do you think it's, it's, it's safe to say that nowadays? So, Felipe, first of all, uh, really great to hear you. I have wonderful memories when we saw each other both in Brazil and here in Germany. Um, to be very honest, Felipe, uh, and I'm not saying this because Rüdiger is, uh, is with us and we have surgical colleagues. Um, TAVR has developed into a, a robust uh, treatment strategy. However, surgery has also developed. And surgery over the last 10, 15 years has gone to millimeter invasive, even reconstructing aortic valves. So I think even though interventional cardiologists and even uh, here in, in, in Europe and in the United States claiming that TAVA should be the standard treatment, we know that we are successful. We have no idea how TAVA will perform at younger age, because many people are still confounding low risk with younger age. There is simply no data uh, on younger age, meaning age below 70. There's a question. That's why we have the heart team. That's why we have a discussion on an individual basis, who is, uh, which, um, pay, which strategy is better for an individual patient, surgery or cover. I don't think, I think in general, I would say patients above, above uh, 80 normally go to TAVR. Uh, I know there are discussions, but I would say in general, patients above 75 are primarily considered for TAVR. Patients below 75 um, are a discussion for the heart team with probably more surgical implants and patients below 60 or between 65 and 55 are definitely, at least in my opinion, should go to surgery. The only thing, the only thing that I would like to add is now the surgeons have to be aware that a follow-up therapy or a later therapy with TAVR or with re-intervention is possible. So they should try to get the largest valve into a given patient in order to make sure, that was my last slide, in order to make sure that we get a good TAVR valve in the follow-up, because that will be a problem, and that hasn't been answered or resolved yet. Hello. Uh, I don't know who is with us. Maybe can you talk some words about this question from Philippe? Rudiger. Yes. Um, first of all, I have to admit I'm a, a big fan of uh, interventional aortic valves. However, um, I do not think that it is uh, the best treatment modality for each and every patient. Um, I, I think for most patients, as uh, uh, Eberhard said, for the older patients uh, above 65, 70, that's our limit right now, um, it is uh, probably the best choice. Of course, there are patients uh, with endocarditis, with aneurysm, um, and, and other comorbidities that you cannot treat with the transcatheter valve. Uh, and um, also for younger patients, for really younger patients, we still have this issue of pacemaker rate, of a higher pacemaker rate 
with transcatheter valves than uh, with surgical valves, um, which, which is an issue for uh, a person who is 40 or 50 years old, I think. So, and also for the biological uh, surgical valves, we have experience of durability, as Ibad showed us, of uh, almost uh, 30 years now. Now, for the transcatheter valves, um, we just do not know. So to implant those valves in younger patients may also bear uh, a special risk. So in the end, I think uh, it is a wonderful treatment, but there will always be a place uh, for surgery in the, in the future too. Uh, I think we have uh, some uh, questions from from the audience. When uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Bergoli um, select the questions, I'd like to uh, ask Solano Berger, uh, who is a cardiologist and uh, echocardiographist, to to make some comments or questions. And then you go ahead with the with the questions from from the audience. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, to Dr. Uh, Hudiger. I'd like to know uh, which uh, is the, the for, for, for you, the ideal patient to treat with severe mitral, uh, function, functional mitral regurgitation, and which is the patient with severe uh, function uh, mitral regurgitation that you don't uh, consider to intervene? Uh, at first, first of all, I think uh, functional mitral regurgitation uh, is the the best treatment is uh, interventional. You know that uh, the the surgical results of treatment of uh, tr uh, functional track uh, mitral regurgitation uh, not have not not very good long term results, and. If you look at the uh, at the mitral clip results in functional mitral regurgitation, those are uh, at least superior to the the surgical results. Now, if you ask me which patient is not eligible for surgery or treatment, I think that there are enough studies out showing that once the end-diastolic diameter of the left ventricle is beyond 65 or even in some studies 70 millimeters, you will not get improvement by treatment uh, of those valves in the in in terms of left ventricular function and and also in terms of uh, New York Heart Association class. So the earlier you can treat uh, uh, mitral functional mitral regurgitation, the better it is. If the ventricle is too large and too much dilated. It uh, does not make much much sense anymore uh, to to try to reconstruct that valve. Dr. Luis Bergoli, do you have some question from the audience? Hi, I, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Lang and Dr. Grub for this excellent uh, panel. And we have Dr. our colleague, Dr. Leandro Roesi, and his question is, what's the role of TAVI in patients with bicuspid aortic valves? Who should answer? Quem vai responder? Ele ou eu? Both. Well, I can, I can tell you, bicuspid valve um, is has been um, has not been studied in, in any of the randomized control trials bicuspid anatomies have been excluded does that mean we should not treat bicuspid valve anatomies we know we treat them every day china japan uh, the asian countries singapore they treat bicuspid valves every single day, severely calcified bicuspid valves. We do the same. And probably you also know, at least in Europe and in the United States, both valves, self-expanding Avolute and the, the Sapien S3, have been approved for bicuspid valves. The question is, 
should we or should we still do a randomized controlled trial for bicuspid anatomy? Then the question is, which valve uh, against what? And what is the time frame? In the meantime, we will probably not answer the question and we will continue using them. My personal view is um, we do not need a randomized controlled trial uh, that I know is controversial and I, I'm not in an agreement with, with many people, but we are doing this every day with really, really good results. The results of both valves and bicuspid anatomies or three valves, I should say, including Lotus, which is available now here, um, we have very good results. And I would not imagine, I simply cannot imagine what should we do differently with a different valve in the bicuspid anatomies. Having said that, we have to keep in mind bicuspid anatomies have not been studied in randomized trials. I'd like to add uh, yeah. a question, uh, Dr. Uh, Lang. Uh, what do you think about in this issue of bicuspid valve, which is uh, usually associated with uh, aortopathy, uh, with uh, enlarged uh, ascending aorta and younger people, uh, which would be the cutoff of uh, the diameter of ascending aorta in the uh, bicuspid valve for uh, replacing the ascending aorta? Um, at, at first, let me let me say that uh, I approve of of every word uh, Eberhard said about the bicuspid valves, but I also warn everybody that, especially in young people, as you just mentioned, you have a significant aortic dilatation, aortic aneurysm, or just sinus sinus aneurysm. And those are extremely dangerous in the long run. So those patients should not be treated with transcatheter valves. They should undergo surgery with a bental procedure or a supracoronary aortic replacement, which is really important. Now, our, our limit for a replacement of the aorta in patients with symptomatic bicuspid valve is 45 millimeters, which is also supported by the European guidelines. That means if the aorta is more than 55 milli 45 millimeters and you have to uh, work on the valve, you should also replace uh, the, the aorta. In most cases of bicuspid valve, I, or we would also tend to replace the aortic root too in terms of uh, a ventral procedure. So, and there are even patients with functional bicuspid valve, not calcified, with, with no insufficiency, no stenosis, but with severely dilated uh, uh, sinuses or uh, ascending aorta. And in those cases, I think the best treatment is still to do a David procedure and replace the aorta because all, the, all those patients with aneurysms uh, of, of the aorta, they will come back later or have dissections later and are really in danger if you are not consequent and do a surgical replacement. Thank you, Rudiger. Yeah, Dr. Paulo Roberto is a surgeon here in the Hospital Moisement. Can you some words or question for the colleagues? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Orlando. Dr. Saad, uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Grub and Dr. Lang, for the nice talks. It's good to see you again, Dr. Grub. And uh, we know that the TAV indications are moving forward every year. But I have some doubts um, about valve involved in young and low risk patients. What should you do? We should. Uh, redo the surgery or do a valve involved procedures? I want to know the opinion about Dr. Lang and Dr. Group. Uh, uh, Eva, do you want me to start? Yeah, you can start. <laughs> um, uh, we do, actually, we do a lot of uh, valve and valve procedures. 
Um, although the, uh, the complication rate and also the mortality is not as low as everybody thinks it is. Uh, however, if you ask me in a young patient, uh, replace the surgically implanted valve or do uh, a, a TAVI implantation and maybe later do a second TAVI uh, when the patient is 20 years older, then do the replacement. This is uh, something we have been discussing for years now and each and every meeting, and I think every center, every surgeon has to come up with uh, uh, his own algorithm how to treat those patients. Um, I, I personally, if I had a biological valve, I would always opt for a transcatheter valve uh, if it is possible. Um, the only problem of the development valve procedures, of course, is that sometimes those patients also need coronary interventions, and uh, sometimes that can be impeded by the transcatheter valve. But other than that, I favor uh, valve and valve procedures. Um, what Eberhard said uh, um, in, in the previous uh, discussion, he said every surgeon should try to implant the biggest valve possible. Now, dear Eberhard, I've been in surgery now for almost 40 years. And for the last 40 years, every cardiac surgeon has always tried to implant the biggest valve they can get in. But I think a, a, there's a, a, a big hope in cracking the valves. And I would advise all surgeons to implant valves that can be cracked by a high pressure balloon, because then you can really gain one or two sizes of uh, the later implanted transcatheter valve. So I see the smiling face of my dear friend um, and um, I, uh, I generally agree. You're asking me if I was, you know, I'm just 30 years old. And suppose I was 60 or 65. What, and, uh, and I, needed, I needed an intervention. I would definitely uh, look for a surgeon that uses his technique to put the largest valve in. Rudiger is a little bit optimistic. Um, I know that not, I mean, I cannot give you any numbers, but basically the surgeons now have to see that we should not, they should not use small valves anymore. And I think uh, I would ask the surgeon, I would start with surgery, ask the surgeon to put the largest valve in, and then I would um, probably then follow up with, with TAVA. If you start with TAVA, remember, then you have to see you, what Rudiger just mentioned. You have to deal with coronary access, potentially, when the patient gets older. Uh, and there's a difference between uh, Evolute platforms and Sapien platforms or other platforms. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I think um, we are not comfortable uh, doing a TAF and TAF and TAF. Say it's, he's 60 and he might be 75 and then for some reason needs surgery. The explantation of a grown in Tava valve is fairly complex and fairly complicated. That sometimes needs major surgery, which could be avoided if you put in a good large surgical valve at the younger age. So start with surgery and then follow with uh, with Tava. As the patient gets older, to me, it doesn't make sense to start with a Tava unless there's a reason. And then when the patient gets older and gets into a higher risk, then do surgery. So my recommendation and what I would do if I was uh, at that group, age group, I would say start with surgery, go to Munich because he puts the largest valve in, since four years now, I hear. And then I wait for the tablets to develop further. And if I was 75 or 80 and I need another valve, then they could put a tablet valve there. We are, we are ahead of time. So uh, last question, uh, Dr. Uh, Diogo Centenaro, which is an anesthetist here from the Hospital Moise de Vento. Uh, 
Uh, please, a uh, quick uh, question, uh, Jogo. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Dr. Grub and Dr. Lange for the great uh, talk. Uh, and just since I'm uh, the only anesthesiologist here, uh, my focus, my mindset is on the early complications. Uh, is there any role now for, or any space for a very fast track uh, protocol uh, for the TAVI procedures since we have increasing number of uh, low and intermediate risk patients coming for the war? What, what was the question? Whether Sorry, uh, if there's any uh, space for a very fast track protocol for the intraoperative, intra hospital uh, stay for these patients that are low risk and intermediate risk, if then we can speak, uh, skip ICU, if can be mo less invasive uh, with monitoring uh, for the procedure. Yeah, um, I, I mean, you know that Vancouver has um, has headed this um, uh, this approach, um, you know, uh, admitted the day before and discharged the same day or day after. That is locally different, but yes, there are protocols. You can do um, things uh, as an outpatient, uh, and then when the patient comes in, you do the anesthesiology and echocardiographic um, um, examinations that need to be done. You put the TAVA valve in, and then depending on the course, you can discharge the patient the same day or the next day. This can be done, is being done, which is called minimalistic approach. Uh, no general uh, anesthesia anymore, <clears throat> just conscious sedation. Here in Germany, it, it doesn't work that way. So in Germany, we are not paid for discharging the patient quickly, but that's a local, um, uh, that is a local specialty of, of Germany. In general, um, America, um, uh, Vancouver, Canada, uh, the Asian countries, they admit the patient the day before, low risk, intermediate risk, the day before and the day after the procedure they discharge. So it's a three-day procedure. Thank you very much. I think uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers. I think this was an excellent uh, section. And I'd like to, to call Dr. Marco Weinstein to, to chair uh, the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Orlando, for co-chairing the session. mais de 90 anos, o Hospital Moinhos de Vento é reconhecido pelo cuidado com a saúde, através de projetos inovadores. Confirmando sua excelência e a expansão de seus valores, nasceu a consultoria Moinhos. Um novo jeito de compartilhar experiências, através de ações focadas em melhorias de gestão, com a utilização de ferramentas inovadoras, visando as melhores práticas do mercado contribuindo na qualidade dos serviços prestados, fortalecendo a tomada de decisão com o foco no bem-estar de quem cuidamos e de quem está ao nosso lado, ajudando a contar nossa história, seja na saúde ou na educação. Nosso jeito de atuar conta com metodologia própria, aplicando nossas práticas em diversos segmentos. A consultoria chegou para expandir conhecimento através de práticas de gestão, medicina e educação reconhecidas internacionalmente. Tudo isso para que você conte com o talento e a experiência dos melhores profissionais que fazem história por aqui. Consultoria Moinhos. Compartilhando conhecimento, redefinindo oportunidades. O que é ser melhor para você? Para nós, é praticar o cuidado de excelência nos momentos decisivos. É ter controle, agilidade e atenção garantindo a segurança. Entregar independência funcional com apoio de métodos inovadores. Entender que nem todos são iguais e merecem uma assistência individualizada. É compreender o outro para construir laços de confiança. Para nós.
nós ser melhor é poder dividir o conhecimento do Hospital Moinhos de Vento com profissionais que compartilham o nosso desejo pela excelência. Pós-graduação Hospital Moinhos de Vento. Não dá para falar de política sem analisar comportamentos. Como entender a medicina sem tratar de inovação? Onde termina a cultura e começa a educação? Todo o saber se conecta entre si e nos conecta às maiores reflexões da vida. Bem-vindo ao Moinhos Talks, um espaço de debate onde experts nacionais e internacionais se encontram. Medicina, política, comportamento, cultura, economia, educação, inovação e telemedicina. Aqui todos os pontos se cruzam e todos os caminhos levam ao conhecimento. Ok, hello everybody. So we have to continue now. I think we are going to move to the next session, which is session four, which is the last session. So I think this is going to be a great session. We're going to have uh, two very, very experienced uh, lecturers here, uh, um, and they will approach different topics, actually. One uh, will be more related to imaging, and then the future of Tavi will come la uh, la later. I have as a, my co-chairman tonight, uh, it's my great pleasure to have Alex Abzaid with us tonight. I hope he's, uh, he's, uh, he's already here. Okay. Can you hear me well? Yes. Hi, Alex. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marco. It's... I see familiar friends' uh, faces. Yeah. We have um, a, a very nice panel here. Uh, Fabio, is, uh, I just saw his picture uh, um, a few seconds ago. He's probably very happy that Palmeiras today, his, uh, his team did very well, <laughs> right? And uh, Fabio is, is there in Sao Paulo. Fabio is also um, almost part of, uh, actually not almost, he's part of our team here at the, uh, at the Structural Heart Group. Uh, he's been working f with us for a long time. Then we have our our chief medical officer here, uh, Luis Nazi, who is a great friend. We have uh, a Fab, um, Pinotti here, who is a experienced echocardiographist of also Marcelo uh, Miloranza, also another uh, experienced echocardiographist. We have uh, Paulo Schwartzman, who is ex um, uh, also works in imaging, uh, especially to, uh, CT. And then Murilo. Murilo is a, a hybrid guy. He does both um, CT and echo very well. So we have this panel to, to discuss the lectures. And uh, I think we, you, uh, I don't know if you, if you want to start introducing our first speaker, who is uh, João Cavalcante. And then uh, at the end, uh, Alex, we're going to have time for discussion and a very nice debate. Thank you, Marco. Well, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation, Mark. It's uh, always a pleasure to be among friends during these difficult times. So I see my mentor and uh, and good friend, my brother, Mari Leo, uh, that mm -hmm. is in, now in New York. I don't know how is the situation there, but I'm sure that he's happy with the future of the United States with a new, mm -hmm. new, new administration. Exactly. And uh, mm -hmm. it's a pleasure now to invite uh, also, my very good friend, João Cavalcante. João is uh, from Minneapolis. He's a, a rising star, and we are very proud to have him as a good Brazilian doing a great success in the United States. He's an imaging guru, and uh, his uh, invitation is to speak about interventional imaging for structural heart disease challenges and um, new frontiers, right? Multidisciplinary field. Uh, João, welcome. 
Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, it's so honored to be here virtually from Minneapolis and share with you uh, some thoughts tonight about the, the role of uh, interventional imaging for structural heart disease. Uh, it's an honor to be here also together with Dr. Marty Leon, who I'm very fond uh, about his incredible work in this field of structural and look forward to his talk as well. And thought about, you know, sharing with you over the next 20 minutes or so, some thoughts about the role that advanced imaging has had for two valve diseases, we won't have the chance to cover everything, but mitral regurgitation and then tricuspid regurgitation. Starting with the mitral, obviously for TMVR, transcatheter mitral valve replacement, this is an evolving field. Uh, we have two ongoing trials from major companies and then some other startups that are ongoing here in the United States uh, that have now been used in cardiac CT as a method to screen patients for potential suitability for these devices. Uh, the mitral annulus is assessed and measured. We use in dedicated software. We're going to go cover this quickly. We need to assess what will be the risk for LVOT obstruction, fluoroscopic angles, the axis. Some of these cases are transapical. Some of these cases are transeptal. And there is a lot of literature about that and also training courses that one, if more interested, can also participate. So, talking about the mitral valve, uh, the mitral and aortic are actually quite connected. You know, looking from the surgeon's view, there is this mitral aortic curtain. It's a very dense fibrotic tissue that connects these two valves. And any interference on the aortic valve will cause some interference in the mitral valve and vice versa. We have this long anterior leaflet that does not have this distinction as we have for the posterior leaflets. We have the two trigones, the left and the right, or the lateral and the medial. And all of this would be important because when we take this data <clears throat> into CT, we need to segment this mitral annulus. And as you can see, the saddle shape of the mitral annulus going all the way up into the aortic valve create this anterior horn. And for the purposes of being consistent and reproducible, we truncate this anterior horn into a straight line created, which we call the TT or trigone or intertigone distance or trigone to trigone distance. And this is a D-shaped annulus that is a simplified version that we can make this more reproducible for sizing of devices. Now, this is another cartoon just depicting what I just described to you, the straight line, the trigone to trigone, and we need to obviously measure this annulus throughout the cardiac cycle. And therefore, the imaging acquisition needs to encompass the entire cardiac cycle. And the question could be, well, okay, so when should we measure this annulus? Well, it would depend actually on the pathology. So for functional or secondary mitral regurgitation, it tends that the mitral annulus will have its largest size in the early diastolic phase. Whereas for patients with primary mitral valve disease, mitral valve prolapse because of the billowing and the bulging of the leaflets into the left atrium, it will create the largest dimension and actually in the early systole. In patients that have very far advanced functional mitral regurgitation, we could see that almost there is not a lot of dynamism and this mitral annulus stays pretty much flat. But nonetheless, we should still image and measure both in systole and in diastole and take that largest measurement for the sizing of the device. Let's take, a, for example, a case that we did in the early uh, experience with the intrepid TMVR. We can see this by 3 dte by CT. And this device, which is transapically done, now we have a few cases report of transepto, and Dr. Leon can then discuss this in more details. We need to do the segmentation just like what I described. You put interpolated spline, you click, 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 you create the mitral annulus, you measure the trigonal distance, and based on the degree of oversizing, you have here this atrial brim, and you have a 27 uh, millimeter valve inside. This is going to be coming from the transapical, and then we can do a simulation using an STL file to what will be the passage, the new LVOT. And now this Apollo trial is ongoing, uh, both randomizing patients to TMDR or to surgery. And we have also a MAC uh, cohort, mitral annular calcification cohort for these patients that are ineligible for surgery. 
So speaking of the new LVOT, um, this is uh, something that obviously came as we were starting to explore this field to realize that the presence of the anterior leaflet um, would create potentially a narrowing of the outflow tract and turbulence and sometimes obstruction. And by far, this is the parameter that we pay the closest attention to because it's the one, and typically if below 1.7 square centimeters, we could be associated with an increased risk of outflow tract obstruction. And you can see that this is much less common in the valve in valve because we don't have that into your leaflet, right? We already have a docking station. But valve in ring or valve in mech, this is where problems could still occur. So taking this concept into the Trim Trapid, the Apollo trial, this is an interesting paper that came out last year. That, you know, starting with this, we're a bit conservative. Okay, let's measure when the passage is the narrowest at the end systolic phase. And with that, almost a third of these patients would be ineligible for the trial because of small neural VLT. But it turns out that actually most of the stroke volume most of the blood gets ejected and passing through this is actually in the early phases of the cardiac cycle. So that if we go here too late, we might be calling a lot of patients that might not be suitable. Whereas the authors here said, why don't we just integrate and average the entire cardiac systolic phase, not the entire cycle, but the entire systolic phases. And with that, a third of the previously screened patients that now would become eligible for this device. So hold your thoughts about that because that is specific for the Intrepid, but might become also important for other devices, such as, for example, the Tendine. That's one that we have uh, the largest experience with, the Minneapolis Heart Institute. We were in the part of the early feasibility, and now there is the ongoing summit trial. This device is quite unique. It's uh, transapical. It has this apical pad fixation that connects with the tether, therefore the name Tendine, with the valve and the atrial brim. This, uh, has, uh, this device now is commercially available in Europe, has gotten the CE mark and now is ongoing. And we have more than 100 patients published data demonstrating its effectiveness in the right patient selection. Still one out of three patients is being accepted because of many issues related to size, new LVOT, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how about mitral annular calcification? That's obviously a very challenging group of patients, both from surgery, but also from transcatheter approaches. Not uncommonly, sometimes concomitant to aortic stenosis. And the first experience was obviously with the Sapien 3 device, uh, which is trying to fit an aortic valve into the mitral annulus, which is quite irregular. And as you could expect, a very high mortality at the first half improving with size and algorithms to one in five patients dying at 30 days. Um, a lot of complications related to either outflow tract obstruction or valve embolization need for a second valve. And needless to say, still now being done uh, with improvements and continuing iterations, but obviously could we have a better option than and understanding better these patients. And this is a proposition that was recently published. Uh, Dr. Marta Leon is also on the uh, paper. Using this MEC score, using four variables, you know, what is the thickness of the calcification, the extent, whether it involves the trigones, whether it involves the two leaflets, to predict embolization. Um, that is obviously one of the complications, the other one being more commonly the outflow tract obstruction. And they found out that if the score is above seven, um, but as important as the score being higher, the more calcification to anchor that, is also the oversight. So in patients that were undersized, they embolize. So as important as it is the MEC, is the importance of oversize and potentially flaring that too. And this is all, as you can imagine, iterations of a procedure that is attempting to use an aortic valve into the mitral position and potentially better devices could come handy for this challenging group of patients. And this is our first compassionate uh, use experience with the Tendine, a patient that have aggressive mitral calcification into the ventricle. Uh, and you can see that there was a preparation with the balloon to prepare the landing zone and move, move some of the anterior spicules. And to date, um, 
15 patients worldwide have been treated uh, with this um, <clears throat> with great success. No 30-day deaths, uh, no residual mitral regurgitation. Uh, and potentially this could be um, an alternative uh, for these patients that are quite challenging, provided that they can pass the screening. And now new devices have been attempted. There is a low profile, there are patients with small annuli, and the company is trying to obviously consider this arm. And there is a Summit MEC arm as well that is ongoing uh, that is now going to hopefully answer the question whether this could be a suitable device. Well, what if we don't have enough LVOT? So then you have to consider how can imaging help? Well, it could help by um, obviously measuring the small new LVOT, but also by simulating what would happen if we were to do lampoon. Lampoon is a percutaneous laceration of the anterior mitral valve leaflet so that we can split and then and, you know, create passage for the blood flow through the open cells of the sapient three. This is before covering all the way up with the anterior leaflet. Here's lacerating so that you would open up. And with that, you have a larger area. And this is work by Jaffer Khan and Robert Letterman from the NIH showing that by doing this uh, procedure, and the majority of these patients could now be successfully treated. There are some modifications of this technique that they started from the base to the tip, and now they're doing from the tip to the base with more success. They have been doing this particularly also for uh, patients with valve and ring where the anterior leaflet is still present, and it seems to be a viable alternative. And this is an example of a patient that we have done with mitral calcification with great results in simulation. This patient did quite well. The other alternative would be obviously to try to do preemptive alcohol septal ablation to induce, infuse some alcohol to the septal perforator that would be providing blood flow to the interoceptum. Sometimes the challenge is that it covers actually the right ventricular part of the septum and you're going to create a transmural infarct. Uh, but a lot of refinements have become. This is work by Didi Wang from Henry Ford Hospital, looking at 30 patients, imaging them about 40 days after the alcohol septal ablation, and you can see there is an improvement, an increase in the new LVOT area of about 110 square millimeters. Still with the some procedural morbidity, 15%, uh, 17% pacemaker, and two deaths. And uh, we have done um, a, three cases so far. Uh, this is our very first that we published, uh, looking at tendine with alcohol septal ablation with patient that had a borderline new LVOT, and then with alcohol septal ablation with success. And now this could open uh, literally the passage and uh, the way for many uh, the, uh, patients that have borderline uh, situation. But also what I would like to emphasize is the role of CT after imaging. Um, this is just a recent publication showing that valve in valve, good uh, positioning of the sapient three. Uh, this is a uh, tendine device. They call it normal, but I would question that this is not normal. There's a thrombus. There is halt as well. Um, so this is not a normal positioning, a normal finding. This is an embolization of a sapient 3 and there's a pseudoaneurysm with the caisson device. So imaging also can inform us that interaction of the valve with the host. And now going back to that intrepid publication, when they said, okay, we're going to take the patients, even though the uh, new LVOT is going to be small, we're going to average the entire a systolic phase. And what they saw is that after they imaged these patients with the device being implanted, the best correlation actually was not with the end systolic, but rather with the multi uh, the multi-phase average or even the early systolic. And what happened is that when they put the device in the image, there was a lot of significant compression in the AP, as you can see the simulation versus the reality in the new LVOT before and the true new LVOT. So that only with that, then we can consider, you know, a potentially higher uh, enrollment of these patients. And I'll be very curious to uh, hear from Dr. Leon, his experience since he is one of the PIs for this trial, on how has this changed the screening and the understanding and the learning for this particular device. Now, this is our early experience with Intrepid. As you can see, the valve is in place. It's a transapical device, um, transapical procedure. There is HALT as well, um, and all these patients need to be on anticoagulation. This is a recent experience with the Evoke, the Edwards system, 12 patients implanted in an incentive that was doing 30-day CTs, 
four out of these patients, two out of these four patients that had CT, they found also HALT. So this is not unique to Intrepid. This is not unique to, let's say, Tendine or to Evo. This is a problematic uh, issue that we need to continue to understand why does that occur. And I would say even for valving valves as well. This is another experience we had with the transeptal caisson. Uh, you can see the inter septal defect, uh, ASD related to the procedure with good mobility, no halt, and good ventricular function. That transeptal device and many others are on the way on the trials. How can advanced imaging help? Also by looking at MRI, the shrinkage of the left ventricle is going to be proportional to how much mitral regurgitation they have. And that amount of mitral regurgitation is better determined by MRI than by echo. So you can see here, too, you know, as an example, a patient that underwent mitral valve surgery, the ventricle shrunk, and the amount of observed change in left ventricle in diastolic volume correlated much better with the MRI than what how much echo had called. And could this be important, particularly for patients with primary, without so much scar, that could not have a VOT obstruction initially, but they could obstruct potentially later on as this ventricle continues to resolve and remodel. And this is something that we have seen a couple of cases, not so common, but calls into question whether we need to pay attention to that. And on the topic of remodeling too, on the, the tendine device, because of that apical tether that is placed, uh, there is some pulling internally here, but you can see that even though in, on average, uh, the end diastolic volume reduced, not all patients reduce their end diastolic volume. So how is that possible? And when looking at this paired data, uh, recently we published that these you know, 36 patients uh, with pre and post CTs, it turned out that the further away from the LV apex, the worse was the remodeling. Uh, the worst was the end diastolic volume, the LV mass, and even the left atrial volume to show that you have to respect the native anatomy. You have to respect how the myocardial blood flow and the relaxation occurs for these ventricles as well. And this has now uh, been uh, quite of an interest, as you could imagine, by Abbott to try to refine the implant procedure and the technique so that we can try to, you know, uh, take the advantage of that and not create a collateral damage for these ventricles. What about cardiac MRI? How can it be helpful for these patients with functional secondary MR? We know the results of COAPT and MITRFR. I don't have too much time to explain that they are definitely complementary, uh, but they created a lot of uh, discussion about why one would be positive, so positive, and the other one was not. Um, there was obviously this conceptual framework by Dr. Paul Grayburn uh, suggesting that patients in the COAPT had much more mitral regurgitation uh, calculated by the ERA to ventricles that were not so dilated. So the main driver here being the mitral regurgitation and by fixing the MR, this patient should benefit, whereas patients in mitral FR had some mitral regurgitation, but they were quite dilated. So this was more of a ventricular problem. Uh, but this does not have patient data and, and does not have clinical validation to this date. And the recent publication from the mitral FR investigators have looked into several cohorts and subgroups of that, and we could not find, they could not find any group that could drive benefit, um, even those that were looking more like a co-apt, uh, they still crossed the line of identity here. So we're still questioning uh, whether or not this framework is applicable. And I would subject um, as an imager that in FMR, is actually a much more complex problem than just a matter of proportions. Um, it has to do with not only how big is the ventricle, how much margin they have, but what is the infarct and the infarct size. And looking at this uh, through the MRI camera, uh, we uh, did this uh, large study from the Cleveland Clinic where I trained almost 600 patients, everybody ischemic cardiomyopathy with bad ejection fraction. They were followed by almost five years. Everybody has coronary disease from one to three vessel. And you would think that the more scar they have, the more mitral regurgitation, but there was no correlation. However, what we saw is that there was a very strong interaction. It should say that in patients that have little scar, if you put more mitral regurgitation, they don't increase their risk. But if they have a lot of scar, infarct size of 30 to 45%. A little bit of MR, it's bad for these ventricles. And actually in a cohort of 121 that had cabbage or mitral valve repair, you could see that this yellow line was patient that had a lot of MR, 
but not a lot of scar. These patients, you cannot wait. You should try to intervene. On the other hand, in patients that have a lot of MR and a lot of scar, it doesn't matter what you do. They either die or they go for a heart transplant. And this is with an invasive open heart surgery. Could it be that a clip would be much more elegant and less uh, comorbid? And that's what uh, Dr. Carabello had mentioned in the uh, editorial for this paper, suggesting that the scar burden that was not measured could be certainly responsible for this different results. And even when we looked at trial like COAP that was extremely positive and guideline changing, we still have, uh, at the end of the two years, 54% of these patients uh, considered to be uh, non-responders, either because they died, they had heart failure hospitalization, or they had the lateral move in their KCCQ. So can we do better? And this is not related to the amount of MR that they have, but it's probably the underlying myopathy that we ought to pay attention. This is <clears throat> a case of a patient from our center recently that had two clips, ischemic cardiomyopathy, and was readmitted with three months after mitral clip. You can see that he does not have a lot of mitral regurgitation, but he has a lot of scar. Um, and that scar we can quantify, um, and that could be at play as well on how uh, we should intervene in these patients beyond the clip, medical therapies, et cetera. And this is just a prelude to uh, what this paper uh, from Germany has shown, 22 patients, they only divided yes or no fibrosis. And they saw that those without fibrosis, there was a substantial improvement in their New York Heart Association class, whereas in the presence of fibrosis, these ventricles or these patients had a lateral move or even died. So we ought to pay attention to that because that might give us some insights. And even in patients with defibrillators and devices, we can do cardiac MRI. That's not a problem. And that's uh, finally 2021. Just to conclude about tricuspid regurgitation, um, it's a topic that we are doing a lot of work now through uh, the triluminate trial. It's a disease that takes a lot of time. There's a lot of impairment, even in the presence of moderate regurgitation, right into dilates, tricuspid annulus dilates, then atrial fibrillation works as the fuel for the fire. By the time we see RV dilation or RV dysfunction, these patients are already way, way, way sicker with other RV, um, liver dysfunction, renal dysfunction, and many other things. And so if you want to take away one image would be, look at the right atrium or look at least at the tricuspid annulus because they are gonna be the cannery in the coal mine. They're the first ones that dilate. And when you look at the CTs of these patients, you can see how massively dilated these uh, atria are um, and the coaptation gap that is massive. And that's why Becky has created the massive and the torrential categories because they do not, uh, severe is too little, it's not enough. We have been using some softwares that provide this very good visualization of all the tricuspid leaflets. And this has been quite helpful, not only to understand the mechanism, but also to guide the potential strategy for clipping of these patients. Um, we can measure the coaptation gaps and we can use that CT for planning as well as in this case here, the triclip procedure. This works for patients with pacemakers too. We can measure the annulus, we can measure the uh, coaptation gap, and we can track the response and remodeling that these patients would have after the clip. This is a recent publication uh, from our group on the early feasibility. Uh, and you can see that the, the clips, even though it's a leaflet therapy, produced also a change in the tricuspid annulus, which is much less fibrotic than the mitral annulus, and restoring, again, the saddle shape of the tricuspid annulus that was lost before, and the reverse remodeling even within one month. So we are very excited into this as uh, we are leading the triluminate imaging sub-study. Uh, Columbia is also part of this study, has enrolled a couple of patients too, and we are gonna be learning quite a lot on how CLIP can change and can find where's the sweet spot for these therapies. Uh, and these patients are not easy to image. Uh, it requires a lot of, uh, it's almost like climbing Mount Everest because they have devices, they have atrial fibrillation, they cannot breath hold. So this is a patient with the Lila Spacemaker Micro, had a prior mitral valve replacement, and you can see scar on the left ventricle and on the right ventricle. Uh, you can measure flow, and this patient had a severe tricuspid regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation fraction of 56%. And this is a one-month follow-up. You can see the three musketeers here, the pacemaker. You see by MRI creates a lot of artifact, but we can still measure the flow. And the tricuspid regurgitation fraction decreased from 56% 
to 21% in this patient now as neurocardial association class one. So in conclusions, I hope to have shown that CT uh, pre and post for TMVR will continue to provide this granular detail for the selection, the procedure planning, the iteration of the procedure. MRI, particularly for the quantification of fibrosis and FMR, is going to become quite important, I believe. And I hope that we can really uh, gain the interest from the trialists and the medical community to consider that, uh, especially because now we have better heart failure therapies as well for these patients. TR is underestimated by ECHO and underestimated because of the quantification is suboptimal. And definitely CT and MRI will be an important adjunct to assess the effects of tricuspid valve interventions. With that, we'd like to conclude thanking many of our colleagues here at Minneapolis Heart Institute and obviously our meus colegas brasileiros pela oportunidade. Thank you very much. Okay. That was a great talk, uh, very nice, very in uh, interesting for a, for a number of reasons. And I think we're going to, I'm sure actually, we're going to have time to discuss later on uh, at the end as well uh, with our uh, imaging experts here. Uh, without any further delay, Alex, I'm, I will call your good, our good friend and your mentor. Uh, we are truly honored and, and with the chance of having here uh, uh, Dr. Marty Leon, who is cert certainly among the top five leaders in interventional cardiology, especially in the structural heart disease field. He is the first author of the major trials in, uh, in, in this area, including the Partridge trials that, uh, that, that gave us support for the use of uh, TAVI in all sorts of patients, including from high risk, prohibitive risk, average risk and now uh, low risk patients. So Mari will give us a, a, a talk, uh, will deliver a talk tonight about TAVI today and tomorrow. And he will certainly will have, uh, stay with us later for the, uh, the discussion and people will have the chance to ask uh, some questions for him. Mari, please. Marco, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, uh, uh, we, are, we can hear you very well. And can you see the slides? Not yet, but probably very soon. Okay, now we can do. We can see both you and the slides. Perfect. That's great. <laughs> well, first, it's it's great to join you this evening. Um, Alex is my brother. Marco is one of my close friends. Uh, so I always feel a, a special emotion and special sense of responsibility to um, share with our colleagues in Brazil. Um, so it is a great pleasure and. Joe just gave a wonderful talk. Um, so um, I'm going to um, fairly quickly cover a great deal of territory because this is a broad topic. Um, it'll be selective because we don't have time to cover everything. And I'll try to give you some impressions about where we are with TAVI or what we call in the US TAVR uh, and where we're going as well. These are my disclosures. So let's begin by quickly reviewing where we have come from. And this is my good friend, Alain Rodier. Um, he is truly a first in man pioneer. And this is the first case that he did um, more than 18 years ago in Rouen, France. This was a man in cardiogenic shock who had an ejection fraction of 10%, a large LV thrombus, no access from the femoral artery, so this had to be approached from a transseptal approach. In a critically ill patient in cardiogenic shock who is not a surgical candidate and had a bicuspid aortic valve. And this is the procedure 15 minutes later, and he did not use general anesthesia and did not use transesophageal echo. So this was really the proof of concept first case to indicate that we could transplant an aortic valve without opening the chest in a critically ill patient. And the early patients were truly the sickest patients. So when I spoke to Alain immediately after the procedure, we discussed what would be next. And our initial impression was that this procedure would be reserved largely for the most high risk patients, the patients that were not suitable for surgery. But I must tell you that we were wrong. 
we could not have predicted that the growth of this procedure would increase by two and a half fold over just the next seven years. This year alone in the United States, approximately 100,000 PAVR procedures. And if we look at the percent of all AVR procedures by 2025, more than three quarters of the procedures that will be done to replace the aortic valve will be transcatheter. So yes, there will be a role for surgery, but it likely will be a diminishing role and only the minority of patients will be good candidates for surgery and the balance will be treated with transcatheter techniques. Thus far, through 2020, there have been over 800,000 PAVR cases done in the world. But I will tell you this TAVR revolution was not a random event. This truly was the inevitable result of decades of very bold progressive iteration in surgery, cardiac imaging, and transcatheter therapy. So this was done sequentially, carefully. We worked for four years before we did that first case in Rouen. Uh, and certainly, even though the, the revolution was not expected, there's no question that there was a great deal of thought that went into this. We could never have predicted that there would be such a rapid evolution of the technology, that there would be so many procedural refinements and simplification of the procedure, which to me is the magic of TAVR. The fact that it can be done simply and quickly uh, is important because you can generalize it to many different operators. We did not expect to see such an avalanche of clinical evidence. This concept of the heart valve team that was accepted and a dramatic reduction in complications and improved outcomes. Now you're very familiar with new, these two current standards for TAVR, the Medtronic Evolute RN Pro, Pro Plus, uh, which is the self-expanding version and the Sapien 3 or the Ultra, which is the balloon expandable version. Um, so there's no question that these are still the leading TAVR systems in the world, and they serve really, and there have been multiple iterative versions of these devices. There have been many other devices that we're not going to discuss, and I'm really not going to focus too much on technology in this lecture, but this is a very rich field with um, significant growth and iteration and careful design changes of the device, the profile, the, the delivery system over a period of time. And then the development of all these accessory devices, symbolic protection, pre-shaped wires, expandable sheets, large hole closure, many different devices to enhance the procedure that I think has made it simpler with fewer complications. Just some examples of the Sentinel cerebral embolic protection device and the Manta, which is a large hole closure device that are available and are being used routinely in many centers. They mentioned earlier in, in Eberhard's talk, the minimalist strategy. This has become the standard in the United States. So it means that we generally do not use um, an anesthesiologist for general anesthesia. We use more conscious sedation with an attendant anesthesiologist. We usually do not use transesophageal echo. This is a percutaneous transfemoral access procedure and we minimize everything, including not sending the patients to an ICU, they are monitored in recovery areas. I would say that almost all TABR cases worldwide are now candidates for some version of this minimalist procedural strategy. And I can tell you that the median length of stay after TAVR now is one to two days at our hospital. We admit patients usually the same day and they have the procedure and are generally discharged either the day after or the day after that. So this has truly become a minimalist strategy. Now we talked about the evidence. This is that first patient again, and we reported that first case, and we reported sequentially essentially every case that we did in the medical literature. And I felt it was very important for us to be conscious of not only pointing out the good things, but also the complications associated with TAVR. So here again is Alain Cribier, our first in man pioneer. And in that first publication, we said that non-surgical implantation of a prosthetic valve can successfully be achieved with immediate and midterm hemodynamic and clinical improvement. And I think that this was correct, uh, but this was an understatement. 
I will also say that you've seen another first in man pioneer, and that's Eberhard Grube. And this is his first publication that was in 2005 in CCI, which is the first case report of the self expanding version of this. So it's nice to see that for both of these important devices, that so much attention was paid to um, reporting the data in the medical literature. In fact, if we look at the amount of data that's been generated, these are 24 completed or ongoing TAVA randomized clinical trials. Since 2007 in the US alone, more than 15,000 patients in FDA studies, including 10 randomized trials with multiple generations of four different TAVA systems. So clearly there's an attention to data. Marco mentioned the partner trials. Well, the partner trial phenomenon is extended now for almost 15 years. And we have now enrolled more than 9,000 patients in five randomized trials and have published over 200 manuscripts and abstracts. So clearly the avalanche of clinical data and evidence helps to justify using these devices and also help to improve the, the procedures and help to um, address complications to improve the technology. We mentioned the heart team, and I want to say that the heart team is growing. We include cardiologists, surgeons, structural interventionalists, imaging experts are critically important, heart failure specialists, the anesthesiologists, many other consultants and dedicated coordinators and non-physician staff. And even now, we're very conscious to include the patient in the decision making. And this is especially true in the younger, lower risk patients. So as an example, here you see a special heart team. At the 10 year anniversary of that first case that I showed, Alain Cribier being given the a Legion of Honor by Alain Carpentier in France for his service to society. So this is a remarkable recognition that a surgeon and an interventionalist would make such important contributions and they would be recognized as friends and colleagues. Now, all of this work that's been done has resulted in a dramatic reduction in complications. If we simply look at the first partner trial with a, a one month mortality of 6.3%, it's now come down in the low risk patients to 0.4%. So there's a 15 fold difference in mortality, very dramatic, the reduction of what we've seen with the developments over the last 15 years. So now we have a lot of evidence, which means we have guidelines, mainly the guidelines have been in the prohibitive high and intermediate risk patients. And that's led us to the most recent series of trials and you've already heard lectures, so I'm not going to show you much data which is the understanding of whether or not in low risk patients, this form of therapy is valid, is equivalent or has advantages, disadvantages relative to surgery. This is important because when we look at the low risk patients as shown in this STS database report, that 80% of the patients are in the low risk category who receive surgery for aortic stenosis. So if we're gonna have a true impact, on the vast majority of patients with aortic stenosis, we must be treating low risk patients. Many of these are younger patients as well, although in the trials we did not include bicuspid disease. Well, it's late at night and, we, and um, uh, we should be drinking beer, but I will tell you that the low risk trials really were the most profound and unexpected results that we've seen so far in the partner series. They were published in the New England Journal of Medicine about a year ago, two large studies, randomized trials versus surgery in truly low risk patients. But in truth, there have actually been four low risk studies, including the UK TAVI study and the Notion trial. There have been four randomized trials in 3,661 patients. And we have impressed a meta analysis um, on all these trials. And the results are quite consistent for these four randomized trials. The partner three study is shown here. This is a triple endpoint of death stroke and rehospitalization at one year, showing a 46% reduction with Sapien 3 TAVR versus surgery in very good surgical centers. 
And, and what I would describe as the clinical care pathway is shown here for the low risk patients. They're admitted the same day. Three quarters do not have general anesthesia. It's ephemeral artery puncture in a procedure that takes less than an hour. Three quarters of the patients do not go to the ICU, but go straight to the floor. They're discharged in one to two days, 96% of the time to home or self care. These patients had rare procedural complications. At 30 days, the mortality was only 0.4%. There was less pain, bleeding, and acute kidney injury or arrhythmias. The recovery was improved in terms of quality of life. And at one year, the mortality was only 1% and the serious stroke rate 0.2%. Those were the TAVA results in the low risk trial in partner three. Now, the results were quite comparable in the Evolute low risk trial, which are summarized here. You can see the methodology was a little bit different. They used Bayesian statistics, but there was low mortality. There were differences in heart failure hospitalizations and disabling stroke favoring TAVR at a year. And importantly, there were hemodynamic benefits looking at effective orifice area, Doppler velocity index, or gradients, clear showing, clearly showing that the supraannular self-expanding device had hemodynamic benefits compared to surgery in this low-risk trial. So these were encouraging results, so much so that Eugene Brownwald, who was one of the panelists after these studies were presented, said that having two similar trials with such similar findings quadrupled the validity of the conclusions and the clinical impact. So this was an important session, an opportunity to present data on two landmark clinical trials showing similar results. If we now look at a meta-analysis of the seven TABR and surgery randomized trials, we see some consistencies. When we look at mortality, irrespective of the risk, we see a 17% relative risk reduction in overall mortality at two years. That is not importantly influenced by the surgical risk. It certainly is influenced by access. Transfemoral does much better than transthoracic. And there's not much difference between the kind of THV system, either balloon expandable or self-expanding. There was also a 19% relative risk reduction in strokes at two years, both any stroke and disabling stroke. And there was a significant reduction in acute kidney injury, nuanced atrial fibrillation, and major bleeding. So I would say that the AS treatment paradigm has now been redefined that the favorable outcomes of TAVR are consistent across the entire surgical risk spectrum, which suggests that surgical risk estimation really is no longer the primary basis to guide the choice between TAVR and surgery. But the one caveat is that there were a significant group of patients that were excluded from the low risk trials, and we should be aware of that. So, we certainly treated many patients, high flow severe AS. These were transfemoral only patients. The mean age was 74 years, but there were some patients that were not treated. Low flow severe AS was not. We didn't treat bicuspid valves. There were some small annuluses that weren't treated. Also multi-valve disease or severe concomitant coronary disease, or if there was high risk caver anatomy. So you must realize that these trials only included patients that were good TAVR candidates. So I think that there will be a shift, there already is in our center, from surgery first to a TAVR first strategy for most patients with AS. And the HAR team needs to weigh the clinical and anatomic characteristics to identify the best treatment option for the individual patient with transfemoral TAVR generally re replacing surgery as the default therapy in most cases. So the conversation is now changing. It used to be that we only did TAVR in patients that were not good surgical candidates. Now we generally prefer to do TAVR first if we can predict that they would be good candidates for TAVR. Many caveats here. Younger patients, bicuspid disease, need to be carefully considered, as was discussed in the previous um, um, uh, session.
Now I want to focus my attention on some of the issues we're going to have to face tomorrow. Some of the things that are not answered. I'm not going to talk too much about technology because we've reached already a plateau in what is very good technology. But I want to point out what I consider to be many knowledge gaps. Eberhard addressed some of these. I'll go quickly and I'll speak to some of them very um, uh, briefly. The use of cerebral embolic protection to reduce strokes is now being used in many centers, but there are many questions. Should it be systematic? Should it be selective? And some of the clinical trials have really not demonstrated an important stroke reduction. This is going to need much further investigation. This is an example of one of the cerebral embolic protection devices that we discussed earlier. Um, the randomized trial that helped to get approval in the US for this study showed a 63% reduction in 72 hour stroke rates as shown here, but it was not powered to show clinical endpoints. It was a relatively small study. When we do a meta-analysis of five studies and over 600 patients, we do see some consistency suggesting that there's a reduction in stroke and mortality of more than 40% with a number needed to treat of about 22 to reduce one stroke or death. But again, these are meta-analyses of relatively small studies. David Cohn just a few weeks ago presented this from the TCT Connect uh, late breaking trials. He looked at the TVT registry, a very large registry, and looked at over 100,000 patients and then segmented those that did or did not have embolic protection. And he did a careful analysis looking at what's called instrumental variable analysis, looking at the in hospital stroke rates and found that there were essentially no differences, a slight numeric benefit, but not a very substantial difference, 1.4 versus 1.55, not a clinically meaningful difference. He also looked at a propensity weighted analysis, and here the difference was greater, still not dramatic, but was statistically significant, and there was a reduction in death or stroke rates, and there was a reduction in overall stroke and overall mortality. But this is, again, an early analysis, not randomized, but done from a large data set using very sophisticated statistical techniques where the primary and secondary powered endpoints really didn't even agree with each other. So we need to do more clinical trials and a very large randomized clinical trial that protected TAVR study is ongoing, will involve anywhere from three to 6,000 patients looking for stroke reduction. You've heard a lot about the importance of valve leaflet thickening. CT studies are fundamental, and the issue of clinical valve thrombosis is important. Raj Makar has done a lot of work with the partner three investigators. You've heard some very nice data presented by Eberhard, so I'm not going to spend very much time reviewing this. These concepts of hypoattenuating leaflet thickening and reduced leaflet motion are important. We don't know how clinically significant they're going to be. We did a randomized trial as part of the partner three trial and demonstrated that there was a significant frequency of halt at 30 days. But even more interesting to me was that it increased between 30 days and a year and was about the same in both TAVR and surgery patients. It was fascinating that about half of the patients with halt at 30 days spontaneously without any anticoagulation got better at a year and about 20% of the patients that had no halt at 30 days developed it over the course of a year. Patients with halt generally had reduced leaflet motion almost all the time. But it's interesting because they don't generally have significant reductions in mean gradients. Um, only with very severe halt did we see as much as about a four millimeter on average would um, increase in mean gradients that wasn't even statistically significant. So the hemodynamic benefit or the hemodynamic impact of HALT is not entirely clear. And there were very few clinical events and there was no association between the frequency of HALT and clinical events. So we do not recommend routine systemic anticoagulation or routine CT scans after TAVR, but more work does need to be done. 
Eberhardt's talk about all the new definitions for bioprosthetic valve durability. This is something for the future. These new definitions um, have been refined. There have been multiple versions. Uh, within the next two weeks, VAR 3 will be published with another refined version of these new definitions of bioprosthetic valve dysfunction and structural valve deterioration. These are some data looking at late follow-up with either balloon expandable or self-expanding devices showing severe SVD by serial echoes, only 1.3%. And bioprosthetic valve failure, only 3.7%. This is encouraging data, but certainly not enough patients, not followed long enough to say that we have equivalent durability compared to surgery, but these new definitions will help us in making these assessments in the future. The safety and durability of a TAV in TAV procedure and the safety of failed TAV or surgical explantation is now being explored. And there's new data that we'll be um, learning in the future um, because the TAV or valves ultimately will fail, as all bioprosthetic valves do. But how to best treat them? Explantation and repeat surgery, or TAV and TAV, is being developed now in a variety of clinical trials, and we don't have good answers yet. There are issues relating to coronary access, especially in patients that already have coronary disease and especially in younger patients. So this is another area of importance, and it's true with both of the valves. Um, but there may be difficulties in trying to access the native coronaries through the um, um, uh, TAVR frame. There's a lot of subtlety um, in terms of how to do this. There are new techniques of commissural alignment that may improve coronary access. So this is an area for the future as well. The management of post-TAVR conduction disturbances is also an area for, for future development. We all know about new pacemakers, but the important new area is left bundle branch block. This is work that we did with our colleagues at Columbia, um, Tamim Nazif, and over 3,000 patients in the partner trial. And it was fascinating to us that if you have a new left bundle branch block, it was associated with late mortality, cardiovascular death, rehospitalization, and a reduction in ejection fraction. So untreated new left bundle branch block is an area that needs to be more carefully explored in the future. And in the future, we may be putting pacemakers in some of these vulnerable patients because it does affect late outcome. And that's shown here again in a Kaplan-Meier event survival curve. Eberhard mentioned um, optimal antithrombotic therapy. This is another area of confusion that needs to be developed. There are about seven randomized trials that are either now completed or ongoing. This involves both antiplatelet and antithrombotic medications. The most recent is the popular TAVI trial presented um, recently at ESC. Uh, it looked at single versus dual antiplatelet therapy, and I can tell you there is now strong, stronger evidence to suggest that there is no value in dual antiplatelet um, therapy compared to single antiplatelet therapy um, in patients with TAVR. In fact, there's increased bleeding, there's increased non-procedural bleeding, and if you look at CV mortality, non-procedural bleeding, stroke, and MI, it's also worse with dual antiplatelet versus single antiplatelet therapy, in this case, aspirin. So we are generally no longer using dual antiplatelet therapy unless the patient has concomitant coronary disease and a recent PCI. The management of severe AS and the setting of concomitant disease is being addressed in many clinical trials. Complete TAVR is about to start. This is a massive 4,000 patient randomized trial looking at complete revascularization versus medical therapy in patients with severe AS and concomitant coronary disease. It's developed out of our um, Canadian um, colleagues in Vancouver, but it will be about 80 sites. It'll be a fascinating trial that will address a question that we need to answer. Many of the patients with AS have atrial fibrillation. Last week, we just completed enrollment on the WATCH TAVR trial, which is a randomized trial in patients that have atrial fibrillation and AS, comparing 
TAVR plus Watchman left atrial appendage closure versus TAVR plus medical therapy. Samir Kapadia is the national PI. I've been working with them on this trial. Very interesting study. We talked about bicuspid disease. We have a two-day um, uh, bicuspid workshop next month to address many of the issues. Diagnosing bicuspid disease, I believe, can be done much more carefully and systematically using CT scans, as shown here, uh, by work done by Hassan Jalahawi. There have been two recent registries with Evolute low risk and with Sapien um, uh, 3 low risk, showing very good clinical outcomes. This is going to be published in JAMA Cardiology. Excellent hemodynamics and relatively low a, um, a paravalvular regurgitation. This is the Evolute study. And similarly, the partner three bicuspid study showing excellent clinical outcomes um, at a year. Um, what appear to be good hemodynamics with valve areas of about 1.8. And again, very little paravalvular regurgitation. Now, these are selected patients. But certainly, there is growing data in bicuspid disease and more work that will need to be done in the future. We are also studying asymptomatic severe AS and symptomatic moderate AS. And there are two important clinical trials. We've enrolled 700 patients in the early TAVR asymptomatic severe AS study. This is a fascinating clinical trial. Philippe Genero and Alan Schwartz are the co-principal investigators. And my good friend, Nick Van Meegan, uh, and I have been working on the TAVR unload trial, which is moderate AS in symptomatic patients with heart failure. And we've enrolled about 100 patients. But I will tell you, moderate AS is going to be the target of the future. There are interesting data. This coming out of an Australian ECHO database suggesting that the untreated natural history of moderate aortic stenosis carries with it a mortality which is similar to severe aortic stenosis. And we have some interesting work that we've done with Jerome Bax in his um, Leiden Natural History Database indicating similarly that moderate AS, untreated, carries with it a poor prognosis. So you can expect more clinical trials. And finally, the life journey with aortic stenosis in younger patients. Um, this is still a dilemma for us. Uh, there are some new techniques of aortic valve remodeling that may apply. We have to deal with multiple procedures in these patients. And as Eberhard was discussing earlier, it's a little bit of a dilemma to decide which procedure should come first. This is a new device called the Leaflex Aortic Valve Remodeling Device. So this is a device that remodels the aortic valve. It, it has um, scoring blades that fracture leaflet calcium and improve leaflet mobility. This is now being taken into three clinical trials, already started in Europe, an, an early feasibility study in the US, and another study in China. We think this may be used standalone, or as a bridge to TAVR in certain patients, or even to possibly prepare the valve in certain cases. But the idea is maybe in younger patients, you can extend the, the natural history without requiring valve replacement in some patients by using remodeling techniques like this. But as was said earlier, age is important. And in the youngest patients, we still think surgery is the best choice, unless there's a reason not to do surgery. And that probably extends to at least or in the range of 65 years. 65 to 75, I still think is an area for discussion where there's shared decision-making in the heart team over 75, I think TAVR is generally preferred. So to conclude, when we started this journey 15 years ago, this is the first patient we treated at Columbia. He was 92. He had multiple comorbidities, could barely walk across the room. And we were fortunate to have a successful procedure, and he was playing golf um, one month later. But now the patients we treat are different. This is a patient who's 65 years old. He had a previous radiation therapy for a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, he was treated by my colleague, Philippe Genereau, uh, in Montreal uh, the same day. 
He came in in the morning and left at 5 p.m. that day. And we're seeing more and more of these younger, low-risk patients that are very good candidates for TAVR, and this is part of the future. And of course, I will always emphasize that um, you know, these are special patients. And this is one of our favorite patients who, after a TAVR, celebrated her 100th birthday. And I think it's important for all of us to embrace these new technologies, to be very patient-centered in our approach, uh, and to recommend either things like TAVR or surgery on an individual basis. But we are seeing a rapid evolution of this technology. And I think the future is very exciting for TAVR uh, and certainly for other valve therapies using transcatheter techniques. Thank you very much. OK. That was uh, simply amazing, Maria, as usual. But that is, was even better than, than I expected, because you cover every, every single aspect uh, from Tavi since the beginning to the future and all the, the new um, uh, possibilities that will come for in the next uh, few years. We are really late in, in time. Actually, we should be uh, ending the, the, our, our um, symposium at this time, but I think we're going to, of course, we're going to have time to discuss uh, because we have this distinguished uh, panel here and uh, we have to use this opportunity to, to, to discuss with you guys and share the expertise. Eberhard, I think, is still awake. He was sending a message to me. He was uh, 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 listening to your lecture. And I think um, he was uh, the pioneer here in, in, at his hospital as well to do TAVI with us uh, a few years ago. So maybe he is going to, to help us in the discussion as well. So Alex, please, uh, can we start with, uh, with some questions uh, or asking the panel here? Uh, we have Fabio yeah. in Sao Paulo as well. Let's, let's get started, please. Yeah, we give a chance for the panelists to ask a couple of questions. But let me start with something that uh, is, is um, intriguing me for the past uh, few months. And that's uh, regarding the atrial component of uh, mitral regurgitation. I think I learned that from my good friend, Ebahar. And uh, I would like to hear my thoughts uh, about the atrial enlargement, if it plays an important role in the mitral uh, insufficiency. And then if João can complement uh, you, you know, Jean, I have seen here in the first team end that I conducted recently with the millipede device mm -hmm. that there is something uh, such as uh, atrial remodeling. So I was very impressed to see that after you treat a severe MR, there was a, a, an important and, and visible uh, decrease in the uh, atrial size. So let's talk a little bit about the the atrial, because that's something that uh, we don't consider in our decision-making process. Well, you know, we see that both in, in mitral regurgitation and we see it in tricuspid regurgitation. And there is a version of mitral regurgitation where you don't see as much in the way of left ventricular enlargement. These are generally patients with long-standing atrial fibrillation who have predominantly left atrial remodeling and functional MR and functional TR that is associated um, in part, you know, due to atrial remodeling. Um, you know, and these are patients that are good candidates for therapy. Um, and um, uh, these are candidates that respond well to a variety of transcatheter techniques to be able to reduce the, um, uh, um, regurgitate lesion, either on the left side or the right side. But you're absolutely right that this has become a more newly recognized phenomenon as one of the um, um, causes of uh, functional uh, regurgitant AV valve lesions. No, I completely agree with Marty. Uh, there is a nice publication, uh, European Heart Journal, from Dr. Enrique Serrano, looking at the cohort from uh, Olmsted County, and they found and the prevalence in the community for almost 15% of these patients had atrial FMR. And indeed, you know, talking about the millipede device by Boston Scientific, you know, as an annuloplasty, percutaneous annuloplasty, that makes a lot of sense uh, that these patients, you know, we ought to consider. They present typically with HEFPEF uh, in atrial fibrillation, and uh, 
And the corollary of that is also sometimes they might have tricuspid regurgitation because the right atrial dilation can also be present. So it is an entity that we're starting to learn more, but not all of the patients that have atrial dilation will develop atrial, uh, develop mitral regurgitation. And there are some other interesting imaging studies talking about, you know, okay, as the atrial remodels and the mitral annulus remodels, do the leaflets also remodel to cover that territory, that area? So they're talking about the ratio. Uh, still a lot to be learned, but uh, it is an interesting therapy uh, for this particular group of patients. Yeah. Wonderful. Fabio, you want to go ahead and ask uh, one or two questions and then we move to the panelists. Well, thank you. So I, I'd like to ask a question to João. So first of all, uh, beautiful talk. It was really amazing and congratulations for all your contribution to the field. I'd like to hear a little bit of our thoughts about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in this field. Do you think we are too far off uh, putting a patient through a CT and then the computer will do the measurements and tell us this case is very high risk for coronary occlusion or uh, annulus rupture or LVOT or obstruction or something like that? Do you think we are too far from that? Oh, that, thank you, Fabio. Uh, I, I don't think that we are too far from that, uh, but imaging is an important piece, I tend to believe, but there's still the, the gestalt. There are still some details. It takes a lot of also uh, annotated data to be fed to the machine so that the machine can learn, which we already are doing, right? When we do the measurement of the annulus, the coronary height, every single thing is annotated so that you can feed that into the software. Um, there is also some work on looking at the myocardium of patients with TAVR, um, and something that Dr. Uh, Marta Leon has also done you know, in their group, uh, looking at the presence of cardiac amyloidosis in these patients with TAVR. And now with the CT, one can look at whether these ventricles have cardiac amyloidosis or not by looking at the amount of what you call extracellular volume. So, yes, I think the future would be that, you know, CT will provide you a lot of refinement and information uh, and hopefully expedite that process to us. What do you think, Marty? Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about this, and I think that there are many ways you can approach this. Um, one of the big problems is that we don't have the ability to access and screen enough patients for valvular heart disease. Um, and we don't have enough trained sonographers. We don't have the availability of echo machines everywhere. Uh, and there are several people who are using a point of care handheld echo machines that can direct a lay person to obtain a reasonable echocardiogram that can be interpreted using artificial intelligence and deep machine learning neural networks to be able to diagnose a moderate severe AS and moderate severe MR. Um, and these things are actively being developed. There are several companies that are focusing on this. And I believe in the future that the screening of valvular heart disease is gonna require a more generalized ability to interpret images like echo images without having a physician or a physician extender um, present. Um, so I think that's one of the roles for machine learning that I think is very important. Um, there are also some sophisticated um, algorithms that are being developed. There are companies, FIOPS is one of them, and another company that uh, is just dedicated to um, deep learning using CT images. Um, so a lot of the CT images can be read. Some of the routine ones can be read probably as well using some of these um, techniques than, than you know, having them read by individuals. So, so I think in the future there's going to be... Uh, uh, a major transition when it comes to image interpretation to incorporate deep learning to be able to assist us to get um, more accurate uh, image interpretations and to be able to screen patients more successfully. 
asking. Ma Marco, perhaps a, a Nazi or a Pinotti or somebody uh, from your panel there. Yeah. Have a couple of questions. We're gonna go one by uh, one after the after order now, and I'm gonna start with Nazi and having him to, to ask something to the uh, to to the, our lecturers now. Please, Nazi, if you have a question, would be great to have it. Hello. Okay. Marco, thank you for the invitation for this wonderful meeting. Um, uh, from the, my question is very simple about the strategy, how you say the patients. Nowadays, you know that the life expectancy is uh, very longer, uh, 20 and, and even 30 years as uh, we know, we see, and the uh, older women. Uh, how your strategy in the office eh, to approach patients with longer uh, life expectancy uh, about the durability of the Tavir? Uh, because this is very important. Patients will survive 20, 25, 30 years, uh, and Usually, the patient choose the last invasive uh, strategy. So, uh, a patient with uh, 70 years, a woman 70 years, maybe have 20, 25, or 30 years more. How you approach with the patient about the best choice considering this demographic uh, uh, situation? Yeah, it's a very, very good question that we struggle with. Um, uh, you're absolutely right that people are living longer. You know, it's interesting, in the first part in the trial we did, 15% of the patients were over the age of 90 when we put the valve in. Uh, you'd be surprised, not only are people living longer, but they're living better and longer. So their expectations are that they want to be able to do things, even in their 80s and sometimes in their 90s. Certainly, if somebody is over the age of 80, you know, we feel the durability becomes less of an issue. Uh, we don't know if TAVR valves will last for 10 years or 15 years like a surgical valve. Perhaps not. But we also feel that there's a high likelihood that we can do a valve and valve procedure. So for someone over the age of 80, for instance, or certainly 85, the durability issue becomes less important. It's only in the younger patients where we have to have this conversation and talk to them about um, what the preference is to either start with surgery or to start with TAVR. Um, my goal has always been um, to understand that there is a, 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 a lifelong journey with, a, with, with valvular heart disease. Um, and my approach is that surgery is, is often part of the journey, but we should try to limit the operations to one operation uh, to try to see if we can um, uh, avoid doing a second operation in patients because the second operation, particularly late in life, can be very hard. Uh, so our goal is, no matter which we start with first, we try to devise a strategy that ensures a patient, even if they live to their 90s, that they will only um, require surgery at uh, one time. Um, so that could be a tab and tab and then surgery or surgery first. Um, 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 and uh, and then um, um, uh, uh, put a valve in valve. There are many different ways to approach that, but um, our feeling is to try to limit the, the um, uh, surgical exposures to a single procedure. Yeah. Sure, I, I personally think you're right. Uh, for, um, I don't think uh, uh, this uh, the durability is an issue for average, uh, 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 for a patient with an, uh, gray, uh, that is older than, uh, than 65, certainly not. And we learned this with uh, stents as well and, and surgery. Surgery is more durable for a number of patients with left main disease, but patients usually they prefer to go for one procedure and then another procedure than doing the open, uh, open heart surgery. So durability, uh, even for young patients, my, some, some people will definitely prefer to go for less invasive procedure, even knowing that they might have to repeat the procedure later instead of uh, going through a very uh, much larger procedure, uh, if you agree, Marty, right? Yeah, and we have now five-year follow-up. We just presented it, Becky Hahn did, in valve and valve. And the five-year follow-up for valve and valve, this is 
a transcatheter valve and a surgical bioprosthesis was excellent. Um, so we don't have 10 year data yet, but we're accumulating that information. Last thing I will say is, um, and we didn't discuss it, but the, the future of valve technology is changing. Um, and there are very interesting uh, polymer valves. There are refinements on bioprosthetic valves. So the likelihood that uh, in the next five or 10 years that we'll have truly durable um, either polymer or bioprosthetic valves um, is very good. So um, um, I would argue that in, in the future for younger people, we may not have to worry so much about structural valve deterioration and multiple procedures. Sure. Paulo, please. João, uh, thank you so much for accepting the invitation and being here with us. Uh, I have a question uh, for you. Uh, on the post-TAVI patients, uh, which imaging techniques are you using? And uh, when do you use CT? Dr. Leon says that he doesn't use so much CT. Would you use CT in every patient that has a change in gradient? Where does it fit in the post-TAVI patients? Well, thank you, Paulo. It's uh, so glad to have this opportunity to connect with you guys. Um, we differ. Uh, we are a bit different from the rest of the of the other centers here because uh, since 2000 and late 2017, early 2018, we have created a prospective registry for all transcatheter patients to have a systematic 30-day CT. Uh, in their evaluation as part and the patient's consent for that. And that's uh, what has led us to identify, uh, you know, the halt and obviously sometimes have uh, led us to identify reduced leaflet mobility, even in the absence of obviously increased transvalvular gradients. You could ask, you know, so what? You know, you're finding that you change your management. And the answer is yes, actually. So we have been similar to Columbia, have been now doing single uh, antiplatelet, uh, particularly uh, aspirin or, uh, or plavix if they have coronary artery disease. But in the presence of HALT, and then we can quantify each one of the leaflets and then severity, we started them, we have a very low threshold to start them on anticoagulation if they are not yet candidates. And then we have a follow-up CT at 90 days or so to reassess for that. Um, we believe that this is important and uh, there is a lot of other uh, projects that are ongoing. Um, and we see that also in the mitral space um, as well, as I mentioned before, for both TMVR and for valve and valves. Okay. Okay. Hey, no. You know, that's fascinating folks, that you're able to do that. And um, um, I certainly agree that if somebody has um, uh, asymptomatic rise in gradient with serial echoes, if somebody has a stroke, um, unexplained, um, those would be um, certainly indications where we would do a CT. Um, I will say that uh, we follow carefully the patients that get systemic anticoagulation, and in the older patients, um, they have a high risk of bleeding. Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful about the liberal use of systemic anticoagulation in older patients, even the NOACs. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we've been hesitant to liberally get systematic CTs or to be too aggressive with anticoagulation in many of the TAVR patients. Okay. Murilo, please. Uh, Murilo is also an uh, experienced uh, imaging guy, so probably he'll have some questions for you. Actually, uh, I'd like to have the opinion from both speakers, like from a more conceptual uh, point of view, uh, pinpointing the questions about the machine learning so actually the, the severity of aortic stenosis for example was basically we fixed the the the, the point for surgery based on the cardiac the surgery risk from the whole history nowadays i have to incorporate all other aspects that maybe are important like extracellular volume fibrosis or global longitudinal strain from echo so we have a lot of variables that have a clear implication in prognosis in these patients. So how do you think that we can incorporate all these new measures that are likely to give more information in prognosis than properly to call them a severe or moderate? So probably the moderate that we're trying to, 
treat now, they are not just moderated based only in the criteria that they use, like the the aortic valve area. So how can we incorporate all these new uh, dimensions of severity in these patients? Yeah, maybe I can start with this one. I would love to hear the, the thoughts from Marty as well. So I think what we're trying to get into, and this is a very valid uh, and pertinent question, is in terms of trying to understand actually the ventricular myopathy, right? So in aortic stenosis, similar to any valve, valve disease, uh, we have two valvulocentric when the collateral damage is actually the pressure overload or some other uh, comorbidities or other uh, diseases. So global longitudinal strain, as you mentioned, yes, it has shown some predictive value in terms of association. That doesn't mean that a patient that has normal um, global longitudinal strain or abnormal uh, global longitudinal strain, uh, we should not consider intervention because the patient is asymptomatic. I think this whole area of um, valve intervention, as Dr. Uh, Marty Leon has mentioned, is now going down into the asymptomatic and to the moderately, uh, moderately aortic stenosis because the ventricle might be already sending a signal. And we know, for example, fibrosis in the left ventricle uh, is an important marker, and we should try to intervene before its development. Um, and I think that's what advanced imaging is trying to tell us. Um, and if you could do this more ultimately, the best. Okay. Marcelo, please. Oh, I would like to congratulate you both speakers uh, about the outstanding lectures. And as you have seen so far, uh, multimodality cardiovascular imaging allowed us to understand the complexity of mitral valve disease and the different uh, anatomical and pathological uh, physiology. And then we understand that uh, we need different, probably different devices for different patients. And what about the tricuspid valve? What you have seen so far uh, about the different phenotypes? Uh, do you think you need different devices or one device, a single device will fit all the patients? That's a great point. I'll let Marty talk and then we'll give my perspective. Yeah. Sure. I think both in Minneapolis and Columbia, we've got a special interest in tricuspid disease. Um, we've already implanted six different uh, transcatheter tricuspid valve types um, at Columbia. And uh, Becky Hahn and Sushil Kadali are very interested in this. Vin Vinny Boppett, who's now um, with the YOA in, in Minneapolis, is, is, is also um, uh, you know, a great expert in this area. Um, I don't believe it's going to be one device. And right now, there are, uh, there are at the very least, three different genres of devices, depending upon the etiology of the TR. Certainly, we're using leaflet grasping. Um, Joe mentioned the Triluminate study. There's a similar trial with Pascal also, um, which is another leaflet grasping technique with a central spacer. Um, so there are some patients that can respond nicely to that procedure. There are annular reduction procedures that are being developed, one called CardioBand. Uh, there are others that are also being developed, so we can address annular dilatation. We talked about um, the, the um, form of functional TR that results in significant annular dilatation um, and right atrial enlargement uh, with malcoaptation of the leaflets. And it may be that a direct effect on the annulus would be a good way to manage some of those patients. Um, and then, of course, uh, there are some uh, degrees of severity of TR that cannot be managed with anything other than um, a complete valve replacement. So I think that these three categories of devices are now being explored. There are many trials that are being developed. Some of these therapies can be used in sequence or in combination. Um, and I think that um, there's no question that uh, we had underestimated the and importance and the clinical relevance of tricuspid disease, and that is now being addressed um, in many centers. Okay, Pinochet, please, uh, this is gonna be the final question, and then uh, Alex, I will, after he, he has his question, I will ask you to conclude the session uh, uh, if you want to also to, to give your, your thoughts and uh, as an, also an, an expertise in the field. So Pinochet, please go ahead and uh, 
Okay, first of all, uh, I want to thanks for Mark, Marco and uh, for the beautiful, great uh, lectures that we could see here. And uh, my question is for Dr. Martin. Um, during the, the uh, health, uh, we can, could see the, the, um, the tendency today is a minimalist, heavy approach. Uh, there are some uh, hints or some, or some contraindications for not to do this approach in, in TAVI? Well, it's a very good question. There are some centers that use the minimalist approach systematically in pretty much everyone. Um, we don't believe that, um, and we use it selectively. And in some patients, we think that having um, uh, um, intra-procedural transesophageal echo is very important. There are some patients that for a variety of reasons, we can't get a good CT scan or you can't use contrast where maybe sizing by echo to confirm what the correct valve size is, is important. There are some high risk patients where we're very concerned about the potential of causing a complication where having intra-procedural echo can make a big difference in terms of helping to guide the procedure. Um, so we certainly use a combination of the minimalist approach um, uh, and um, a transesophageal echo with guidance but I will tell you, when it, um, even when we do um, general anesthesia and transesophageal echo, the patients are extubated in the cath lab. They're often not sent to an ICU uh, either. Um, so it doesn't delay the, the um, hospitalization. Um, and we think it may give you some more important information uh, in, in certain scenarios that can be of value in high-risk patients. Okay. I think uh, before we get to the end, I'd like to have Alex to, to, to conclude as my co-chairman. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you, uh, the chance of have uh, this um, interaction. So let's finish with your, your point of view, Alex. No, this was spectacular. I think that uh, we were very privileged and grateful to hear to these uh, two great experts. I think that uh, you know the the imaging piece is is very very impressive as as we move from uh, uh, tower going to mitral tricuspid. I think that it's it's so important to understand you know all the nuances of uh, planning the procedure correctly, following this patient with uh, the best of our knowledge and and having you know a great deal of image interpretation. I think that can be a, a game changer in the future. And Mario, of course, we, we all we all understand that the reason why we are so mature in the field of uh, structural heart, particularly with Tavi, is because of you. I mean, you were really the most important pillar for all the fundamental studies for us to uh, understand and to be so scientifically oriented in terms of our choices uh, for patients with essentially no good options. So I really appreciate the opportunity, Marco. I think that uh, having those two great experts was uh, very unique. We could hear from, from them for many, many hours, but I think it, it's late here and you have to conclude the superb initiative of having these two days of great discussion. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Uh, so I, I think we're going to conclude the session, and uh, I think Rogério also will, uh, will uh, deliver some very, very final uh, um, slides and uh, with uh, late with uh, some taking home messages. Right. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, guys. It was a wonderful event, a marvelous night with two excellent sessions for very teachful uh, lectures. So I'm gonna, on behalf of my colleagues from, can you put the slides, please? On behalf of my colleagues from the, our instructor heart units, it's a pleasure for me to do the take home measures of these sessions. Please, the next slide. The next one. The first lecture, we have uh, Professor Roger Lund from uh, Germany. He talked about next steps of structural heart disease. So 
we saw the importance of stroke prevention during the AVR, the role of EPD, the need of large randomized clinical trials, and the new generator of surgical bioprosthesis reality can be competitive to TVR devices or a facilitator for future procedures. New devices for transcatheter mitral valve replacement and current evidence need of transfemoral devices. The current status of transcatheter mitral valve repair devices and new surgical and open heart options, and also the tricuspid landscape overview with the disease burden and new evidence and devices. Next, please. My dear friend, Professor Eberhard Group, talk about durability of TVR valves, the importance of valve durability concepts. He brought to us the new VARC three definitions and criteria that are impressed. He discussed uh, a lot of things regarding durability challenges, annual size, valve choice, outcomes, protest patient mismatch, hemodynamic compromise, reasons for uh, possible to reduce durability that could be the clinical or anatomical conditions, which surgical valve should be our gold standard, we don't know it yet, types, diagnosis, and clinical relevance of leaflet thrombosis, and brought us some unanswered questions regarding anticoagulation and unplatelet therapy, and also bring us future perspectives of valve deterioration approach. Next. Our friend, John Cavalcanti, talked about interventional imaging for structural heart disease, and he brought us difference in imaging for mitral and aortic valve, and also tricuspid valve. The complexity of the mitral and tricuspid apparatus anatomy, the cardiac cycle measures pitfalls, especially regarding the new LVOT cal calculation, and can bring us some idea in device selection. Also, so the importance of post-procedure imaging importance and possible information, especially the MRI, some uh, new thought that you can use it, and bring us also the tricuspid valve as the next frontier, that on, and where image is crucial for tricuspid evaluation and procedure planning. And Professor Martin Leo closed the session with the lecture TVR today and tomorrow. He brought us a historical overview since the first implementation from Dr. Alain Cribier in 2002 in, in France, and the accelerated global growth, TVR growth and the revolution that it brings to cardiology. The avalanche of clinical evidence, refinements, and simplification that can made this procedure very uh, simple with current devices and systems that allows minimalist strategy with very, very good results. Focus now are on low risk patients and treatment parting shift. New devices, EPD for stroke uh, prevention rate uh, and durability issues are still in, on study. Imaging adjunct therapy and new device. Patients with coronary disease, AFI, bicuspid valve, asymptomatic, moderate AS, or younger patients are still under evaluation, and new and upcoming trials to address knowledge gaps are coming. And uh, thanks a lot for all of your attention. We have over one, uh, 102,000, 1,200 uh, people registered in this event, over 2,000 views in our YouTube, so that was a success, I think. And thanks for my colleagues for the attention and also for our sponsors, Abbott, Medtronic, Boston Scientific, and uh, for everybody, Edward. and Edwards. So, Eduardo? Yeah, just to thank, I think we achieved the, the objective. I'd like to, to thank my colleagues uh, from the organizing committee, Nazi, Carizzi, Marco, Orlando, and Rogério, all the sponsors, all the backstage people from Moinhos, from uh, media, uh, all the foreign speakers that uh, made this uh, event, I think, uh, a very successful event. So just uh, thank everybody. I'd like to thank to the colleagues from Eduardo, Marco, and Rogério to participate in this beautiful and nice symposium. And all the administration from the hospital for the opportunity to work here and to support this kind of symposium in our hospital. Okay. I think I already um, said a lot of uh, things tonight and uh, I, we have to conclude. And my special thanks to the, to the hospital. We've been working here for a long time. This is a beautiful team. 
uh, as, as the head of the CAT lab for almost 20 years here. And uh, I, I, I think I'm very uh, emotional now because I think this is the single best symposium that we had uh, in the recent years. And I, I'm, I'm truly honored uh, with the participants. Uh, uh, we, we had almost 1,000 people uh, watching the symposium at the two nights uh, in a row. And I'm sure next year we're going to do better. Uh, thanks, thanks, and I think we, with this we, we conclude and see you next year. International Web Symposium Transcatheter Approach for Valvular Heart Diseases in Review. Um evento gratuito e 100% online, com os maiores nomes nacionais e internacionais da área. 10 e 11 de novembro de 2020. Realização, Faculdade de Ciências da Saúde Moinhos de Vento, Núcleo de Valvulopatia e Cardiopatia Estrutural, Serviço de Cardiologia, Cirurgia Cardíaca e Vascular do Hospital Moinhos de Vento. <música>